Good afternoon. The Metropolitan Board of Zoning Appeals is now in session for the regularly scheduled meeting of November 5th, 2020. My name is Lisa Minton, and I will be presenting the cases to the board for the review in today's public hearing. We are convened here at the Development Services Center Conference Room, eight, located at 800 Second Avenue South. For these public hearings, the board reviews the correspondence submitted in support of and opposition to these cases. The board also reviews correspondence and recommendations from other government agencies in preparation for the hearings. In today's hearings, staff will present the site plans, maps, photographs, and other documents that comprise the case records. At the conclusion of the staff presentation, the appellant will present his or her case to the board. After the appellant's presentation, if anyone is here wishing to speak in support of the appeal, they may do so. If any opposition is present, the board will then hear from those parties. After the opposition presents its testimony, the appellant will have a period for rebuttal. According to the BZA rules, the appellant has five minutes for presentation if no opposition is present. In contested cases, the BZA rules allow ten minutes for each side to present testimony. Should the appellant wish to provide rebuttal testimony, the appellant should reserve some portion of the allotted ten minutes. At the conclusion of each hearing, the board will deliberate and then vote on that case. The board is vested with the power to act on these cases under the provisions of Metro Zoning Code Section 1740.180. All section numbers that we refer to come from the Metro Zoning Code, which applies to the entire jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Government. The Zoning Code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January 1st, 1998. I will introduce the entire Zoning Code and make it part of today's record. The Metro Code requires a, a record of these proceedings. Because BZA meetings are recorded for Metro National Network, it's imperative that anyone addressing the board come forward to the podium and speak into the microphone. All speakers should identify themselves by name and address and make their desired presentations. The Metro Code requires four members of our seven-member board to establish quorum. The Code also requires at least four affirmative votes to grant an appeal. In the event that five or more members are present, but the, the appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of the public hearing shall be deemed denied by operation law. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party may appeal board decisions to Chancery or Circuit Court within 60 days of the entry of the BZA order. Additionally, as per the BZA rules, an aggrieved party may file a motion for a hearing by the by the BZA within 60 days of the original hearing date. After that time elapses, the board's decision becomes final and no further action can be taken. If your appeal is granted, you're required to obtain the permit for which you apply. A permit must be obtained within two years for the board approval to remain valid. It should also be noted that if false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval could be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the BZA. Mr. Chairman, I submit that all cases have been filed in proper order, all appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. Great, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I do have some preliminary announcements regarding deferrals. Case 2020-212 at 4022 Colorado Avenue has been deferred to the December 3rd meeting. Case 2020-213 at 1053 Scoville Street has been deferred to the December 3rd meeting. And case 2020-219 located at 338 East Trinity Lane has been deferred to the December 3rd meeting. For members of the public, our board utilizes a consent agenda at each of its meetings. One board member reviews the record for each case prior to that hearing and identifies those cases which meet the criteria for the request to action by the appellant. If the reviewing board member determines the testimony in the case would not alter the material facts in any substantial way, then the case is recommended to the board for approval. One enter the record those cases that have been so recommended, and if anyone is here in opposition to one of the cases identified for the consent agenda, we remove the case from consent, the consent agenda and hear it in its regular order. Mr. Chairman, these are the cases that have been recommended for the consent agenda. And for the record, none of the cases has any opposition present. So we have three cases on today's consent agenda. The first case, 2020-217, okay, that's 132 Green Street. 
There's no one here in opposition. Case, case 2020-218, located at 223 Hadley's Bend Boulevard. It's also on the consent agenda. There's no opposition present. In case 2020-238, located at 115 Bellbrook, is also on the consent agenda, and there's no opposition present. Mr. Chairman, staff would solicit a vote from the board at this time. All right, uh, we have a consent agenda. I think there, there was on 238, I do have a note that the, the only condition, and I think it's part of your record too, is that that street porch is not being closed uh, without permission from this board. Uh, and that is the consent agenda. Is there a second? I have a second. Uh, is there any discussion on the consent agenda? All in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed? That motion passes, and we'll do the first case. Well, I'm a council member. Withers is going to talk. Okay, sure. We also have a previously heard case that requires board action. Should we do that prior to the council member? Let's do the council member first. Okay. So yeah. Council member. Yeah, because we know we always, we always, we always kind of defer to the rest of the council member speak since they usually have pretty busy days and I know Brett often takes off work to come here, so you have a chance to speak further. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, it would be in, improper for me to ask the zoning administrator just to go through the spiel he did earlier on our short-term rental group, just for the record. I mean, I'm, it's more that than anything else, because I've been asked, do we still hear them, and obviously. Yeah, the overview is that the um, change in law created a short-term rental appeal board. The board members have been uh, recommended by the mayor's office and approved by the Metro Council, so we have board members for the short-term rental appeal board. However, uh, Code's department in conjunction with the Metro Legal Department is still working to finalize board rules of procedure. There'll be a formal training of the board members, all of whom are, of course, new to service on the board with the exception of one sitting district council member. And therefore, once we have those kind of check marks in place, that board will be in a position to start fielding the cases that previously came to this Board of Zoning Appeals from the short-term rental permit regulation. We're hopeful that that will be early in 2021. Yeah, and I guess now I'm going to flash over and look at our council. Our, do we have authority? I mean, if, is the statute or, I mean, the ordinance in effect that, that appointed or that, that transferred it? I'm just sure. curious. I'm With regard to the transfer, the transfer takes effect once the board exists. The board members have been appointed, but there's been no formal convening of the board. Perfect. So that's the appropriate basis by which the Board of Zoning Appeals continues to hear these cases. Oh, are we lucky? Justice, and that it might come swiftly. <laughs> All right. Hope so. All right. Uh, let's hear from our council people. This where there's council Britt. Right here. Right here. Okay. Um, thank you, board members, for meeting. I know it's uh, a lot of sacrifice out of your day, and with health precautions and so much going on, I appreciate your time and attention. Uh, I'm here to speak on uh, case 222, which is um, a parcel assemblage at 1105 and 0 uh, Bodlin Street. If you have been familiar with the 5.0, that's the Bill Martin's grocery store site. And uh, we, Mr. Martin's family is no longer um, operating that grocery store, so we're looking at some adaptive reuses of that existing structure. And what we're here for today is uh, for the curb cut that is actually closest to 11. Um, this uh, is an old school grocery store with where almost all the existing sidewalk frontage is a driveway apron presently because um, that's the way they did it back in the day. So this site plan will dramatically improve the pedestrian experience. It will eliminate most of the curb cut uh, but we used to have to have at least one point um, to get into the parking lot because otherwise it will come off the alley. So the what we're here for today is for this curb cut that's closest to 11th Street to the left. Um, uh, I've had a community meeting with the, uh, to the east of this side or to the right is a townhome complex and so I've had a community meeting with those neighbors and we're, we're really kind of focusing on the parking lot to the east but that's not what we're here for today. But, but so what this will do, it will, it will eliminate almost all of the curb cut along the um, 11th and Bottle frontage except they do need that one access point. It is very close to uh, the stop sign at the corner of the left of Bottle I'm comfortable with that there because, frankly, because there is a stop sign present, an always stop sign that is present at that intersection. 
Eleventh is a pretty busy collector going into Five Points proper, whereas Fatherland is a local street. So I think it's more appropriate and safer for everyone to have that access point beyond the Fatherland. Um, but obviously, we need to you know be able to get folks in and out of that parking lot somehow. Fatherland, uh, in addition to being a local street, is one that I've been working with the planning department and public works department on a traffic calming program for Fatherland Street. It's called the East Nashville Neighborways Program. Uh, we have had 12 community meetings on that and have some preliminary community feedback on it. It's just that the engineering work on that got paused by the budgetary constraints. So my hope is that once things get a little bit more settled, we can resume that. And that would um, that proposal would lower the speed limit on Fatherland to 20 miles per hour, as well as add some other physical traffic calming measures uh, on the street. So I feel, though, even though it is kind of close to that stop sign, that that is kind of the, the best place to have that curb cut within that existing parking lot that's being reconfigured. And uh, as it segues into additional traffic calming measures, I, I think the safety concerns that public works might otherwise have will be at least. So those are my comments, but I'm happy to answer any questions for y'all. Any, any questions? All right, thank you so much. All right, thank you. heard case, the case 2020-211 was previously heard on October 15th and failed to receive the four affirmative votes. We're requesting the variance from a minimum lot size for three separate parcels located in the R6 district. Right, and I, I can't, I don't remember what the last motion, if, if the motion was uh, to deny or to approve, but I believe it was two to two. Um, and so we had two members that didn't, I think it, it uh, uh, yeah, and again, for this purpose, it, is it, it, it doesn't, we have to have an emotion. Um, again, it, uh, this was for a variance on, on two pieces of property um, for a lot size variance. And so if the question is to the two members that didn't uh, attend, um, to all of Ms. Davis and um, Mr. Newton, did you all review the case and are you prepared to vote on the case? I did. I did. I, I, I reviewed the documents after I've seen the video the last time, so okay. I probably would wait if, if I would. Okay. For clarification, there are three parcels in question that they're requesting to put some to vote. Okay. Three, okay. To our, our address is 012th Avenue North. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so there, there are five, and I, and I believe, uh, I'll ask the, the staff, I think that, that our rules require you to actually watch the video so that you have the full package, so, which would make Mr. Newton an eligible on this vote, so there would be five people eligible um, to vote, and I guess the, the question is, um, does anyone have a motion that they'd like to make? We can do Yeah. Uh, uh, well, we're going to end up with a stock well, and, I, and, it, and it may, it may still, well, it may not have the vote today. They may be able to, to I don't know if the next meeting is within their time frame, because that's something that the staff will do. And if it is, then that'll give uh, Mr. Neal a chance to review it and see. So, I mean, I'll move to defer it. Then I'll second the motion to defer. We move to defer for uh, lack of votes. And then, well, if we defer it, what happens to the clock if we defer this? If the board defers it by choice, then the clock is effectively paused. Okay, good. All right, so that's 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 fair to all, all players. Um, so, well, that that was a discussion of the motion. Um, <laughs> you know, well, because, well, sometimes if sometimes if you if you defer it and the, if the clock runs out, then it that just may it, it, it kind of defeats the purpose of having a deferral. But, um, but so this actually helps the applicant um, and it maintains the status quo. Well, and, and it, it begins to. 
If that unless someone has changed their mind since last time, uh, it doesn't give anyone an opportunity for seeing enough votes anyway. Um, so there's a motion on the floor and a second to defer. Is there any discussion? More discussion after heard all that from me. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand. Uh, any opposed? So that will be deferred one meeting, and uh, we'll take it up uh, then. So if, if we don't have a hotel to vote then, we'll just take a motion and, and let it fall out of the fall. We'll pause for the applicant to enter the room on this case. Next case will be 2197. Case 2020-197 located at 39B Wharf Avenue. They're seeking a variance from the lot area requirement to construct two single family homes. They're also requesting a variance from the contextual front street setback. And also the uh, variance from the side street setback. I'll go through the slides. <laughs> for you. It's a corner lot. Here's Wharf Avenue, Perkins at Perkins Street. There's our aerial view. Here's <coughs> having some technical difficulties with the, with the slides. Three or four days, it might be out to two weeks. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, 
Directions down the street. There's, there is no opposition present. The appellant will have five minutes to introduce your case. Please you. state your name and address. Okay. Uh, uh, this address or my residence? The residence. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Yvette Gendy and uh, I live in 422 Tremont Drive in Clarksville, Tennessee. Um, I bought this lot uh, over a year and a half ago because I have some plans to move back to Nashville. Um, and uh, about the variance I'm requesting, uh, my first request is to um, change the side street setback. Uh, my lot is 30 by 150 uh, feet, and it's a quarter lot, so I have a 10 feet setback on, Ber uh, on Perkins Street. Uh, that leaves me with uh, 17 feet only uh, for the width of uh, my residence, my proposed residence. And uh, I believe that's too uh, narrow, and uh, it's going to be very hard to get a nice design uh, within 17 feet. Uh, and uh, by looking uh, at the neighborhood map and driving around the area, you can clearly see that the property located at 39 uh, Wharf Avenue, which is right across the street from my property, uh, is actually built on the lot line. Uh, there is no setbacks at all at Perkins Avenue. And uh, there is another uh, residence located at 13 Perkins Street. Um, they have like three feet setback. Um, Ma'am, how far, um, if you had, if, if we were to give you a three foot setback, how far would you be from the street? How far would that I, I think a total street? of 12 to 16, uh, uh, 12 to 15 uh, feet away. Uh, because there is, um, there is like a five, five feet uh, pavement, and then it looks like another two and a half feet, and then uh, another three. Uh, no, actually, that would be around ten. ten. That's the thing. So you would be about ten feet from the street uh, yes. with this setback because you already have a right of way that has sidewalk in. Yes, sir. Okay, I was just curious. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then my second request is to be able to construct. Uh, two houses on that lot. Um, on September 17th of 2019, I was invited to a community draft review meeting for the presentation of the Wedgwood Houston Chestnut Hill uh, planning study, which was adopted by the zoning uh, department later uh, on October 24th, uh, 2019. And that study includes my lot in subdistrict 3B, which is Lafayette uh, Street Corridor. Um, and it's to be redeveloped as a transitional area with higher density. Um, I have some uh, sheets from uh, that presentation, and uh, it's calling for sub-district 3D uh, to be uh, redeveloped with higher density, uh, mixture use. Uh, also, the most newer houses or constructions in this area uh, most of them, they have, almost all of them, they have two houses. So, lot 41 has two houses, 41A and 41B, which is just adjacent to my lot, and it has the same size, 30 by 150, uh, and that's the same for 41B. Uh, lot number 43, I'm sorry, 43 and 41 and 43, they have two homes, and then lot uh, 47, Wharf Avenue, again, it has two houses. Uh, and right 
behind my house, there are, uh, again, two homes on each uh, lot. Uh, the addresses are 18A and 18AB uh, Claiborne Street and uh, 20A and 20B uh, Claiborne Street. And uh, the two houses, or uh, there are currently uh, construction on lots uh, 41 Wharf Avenue and 43 Wharf Avenue. And um, the, the owner is affordable housing resources, and they are building four uh, micro homes on these lots. Um, and they will be selling them for around 130,000 each. Uh, which is going to depreciate the value uh, of my property, I believe. <coughs> and, How uh, big are the homes that you're planning to build? Well, okay, uh, let me talk a little bit about my background. So, yeah, um, I'm not, I mean, I, I really am only, I'm, 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 oh. I'm, 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 <coughs> you can use that for the rest of your five minutes, however you want, but I want to know how big the houses are you want to build. Uh, around 100, uh, 1,400. Each fourteen hundred. Yeah, okay. around that. I don't, I don't have design sets yet. Ma'am, yes. You have one minute remaining. Okay. Okay. Um, and I have another uh, request is uh, to reduce the front setback uh, uh, at Wharf Avenue, um, and I, I would like I, I believe it should be around 35, 37 uh, feet, but I would like to change that. Uh, to 10 feet because I would like to have um, secure parking uh, between the two houses. Uh, I'm a single mom of two beautiful girls and uh, I'm maybe moving to have to be close to their uh, schools because um, they are going to uh, uh, colleges uh, in a couple of years. And uh, this area is growing and I can see that it's changing but currently it is still not very safe to live there and uh, I would like to have space between the houses uh, to park the cars and I'm uh, intending to have like a, a fence uh, with garage doors between them and my main intention is to have one um, uh, house uh, with uh, ground floor because I live with my two girls and my mother so one house is going to be for me and her and the other one is going to be for my girls because they are looking to be independent and they want to live alone. Uh, but my background um, does not agree with that. So I think it's going to be very smart to have two houses constructed. I'm living in one. They have independence in the other. Uh, but I can still uh, see them every day. Is that five minutes? Okay. All right, are there any questions for that one? No questions? All right, uh, and we will close the public hearing uh, and discuss. We do have a letter from uh, Council Member Colby Sledge uh, of that district uh, that said uh, while he would be supportive of building a single home and any variances, uh, if any, that were needed, uh, he doesn't support the request for trying to build two. Uh, and I think that's the only communication for and against that in our packet. Um, we, this board's going to have a variance to the to two properties next door, uh, a lot size variance to go through homes. And I know that that was part of the case here. And there's a, to me, there's a, a little bit of a distinction that I think more that some of y'all were probably on the board and remember. Uh, because it wasn't uh, too terribly long ago, but th it was an affordable housing organization, and this board talked at length about um, you know the hardship and, and how to phrase it and, and what to do with it. Uh, the variances, the, the setback variances they asked for were between the two properties, and the lot size variance. Uh, part of the argument was that they were building two 600 square foot homes instead of, or two 700 square foot homes instead of a 1400 square foot home. Uh, the size uh, and the intent was, uh, and the fact that it had the council member support and, and, and other support uh, was what I think tilted the board to say uh, rather than have the nonprofit go through the SP process, uh, which would probably, uh, based on the level of support passed, uh, it would keep the houses more affordable uh, to go through this process, which is 
is where uh, they went through. So to me, it's a little bit different uh, than this request. And you know, I kind of see the, the, the variance, uh, whether it's uh, three feet or, or, or a little more, to still be 10 feet off the road, I think, uh, to me, meets the spirit of the, of the property. I, I'm having a struggle with the specifics on the two, on two for me. I, 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 think it, I think we were clear at the previous one that it was not a precedent setting meeting. It was very specific to those characteristics that, that were there and the specific hardship related to the property owner owning both parcels um, rather than, um, you know, than, than a, a single parcel owner offending yeah. a neighbor. I'll say I um, agree with you and I struggle, we struggle with the Textual, the variance of contextual street setback and bringing, I don't think the hardship is there to bring the home closer to the street than the contextual street setback would allow. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think, the, I think that one thing that is a little bit unique about this lot is the fact it's a corner lot. And so, you know, I think I, I, you know, I definitely have a pedestrian experience here, and you, you have one, you know, curb cut off of the road, which is. You know, it, I think that does help it, but I'm still, and I, I, I agree with you, I, I'm having a real hard time with the front setback, but the side setback, I don't have as much of an issue. Any, any other comments or thoughts? Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? 
Okay, all in favor, say aye, raise your hand. Any opposed? That motion passes. Good luck. Thank you. Oh, shit, that's what we did. Yeah. All right. Next case.
council member? Present? Yes, Nancy. Okay, you see her coming. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have, we have representatives from other here, we have the here, so we're going to uh, have the case introduced. Yes. And then, uh, <clears throat> Council Lady Murphy can speak if you want to speak first or if you want to wait until the end. Or I'll speak at the end. At the end. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right, so then we'll, yeah, we'll introduce the case. We'll hear from the applicant uh, who has 10 minutes, uh, and then we'll hear from the opposition who has 10 minutes, but we will make a transition in between so that I'll put the supporting it. Yeah, they're going, even the appellant will have people rotating out for that okay. Okay. 10 minutes. So there'll be a pause. Yes. And you'll stop the COVID clock. COVID-2020. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, so, about, all right, so, yeah, so it's, it's still better. It's your zero. turn. You can rotate folks in. You have a total of 10 minutes, not counting the time to get folks in and back and forth. Uh, but there'll be a representative of each side present at, at all times just to, to hear the proceedings. Okay, okay so great. So we'll look okay. at the, the presentation of the case. The next case is case 2020-207, located at 3717 West End and 101 Leonard. It's a special exception request from the 30-foot required street setback along Leonard Avenue. They're requesting a five-foot setback to construct a multifamily development within an RM40 district. Aerial view, it is the West End lot, which is highlighted, and the additional parcel behind it on Leonard Avenue. There's an aerial view. This is the proposed site. There's an outline of technical difficulties with our slides again. Here is a rendering of the proposed construction. That's the Leonard side, right? Yes. I'm sorry, I don't know. Yes, this is Leonard Avenue with street parking. Existing conditions. Nice street. Street view along the West End. Yeah, we lost. lost oh, I'm sorry. Trouble with the flash drive to the. The appellant can come up and, and speak on their behalf and introduce yourself by name and address. And there is opposition present, so we will be pausing between speakers to allow for, for social distancing. Chairman. I may remove this mask for presentation purposes. Uh, my name is Tom Light. Uh, I'm at 315 Dedrick Street. I represent the applicant in this matter. I'd like to ask for two minutes for rebuttal at the front end. Uh, and we'll initially also comment that uh, there Mr. were Mr. White, may I ask you to put your mask back on yeah. while you're talking? Yeah, if you don't mind, we, we, we don't have, if you don't mind, uh, we'll just ask everybody to keep their mask on. Since we're in the small room and we don't have the, the screen, no problem. Uh, I just may have to talk a little louder. Okay. Uh, Tom White, 315 Dedrick Street. I represent the applicant. Uh, there were a number of letters sent down here in opposition. There were approximately 15 letters in support, uh, which were not down here before the deadline on Friday. They'd all been handed out. I uh, appreciate your consideration. I'll comment at the front end. It's so importantly, this is a case for a special exception. Uh, this is not a variance where you have to show a hardship. That's very important because virtually every one of the letters in opposition were talking about things that really are not before the board today. They were talking about uh, variance, hardship. Uh, they were talking about height and design. None of that's before the board. The sole issue before the board today is a setback off of Leonard Avenue. Uh, we've got an architect here, engineer, who will cover that. Uh, and at the very front end, I will comment my clients met with neighbors on either eight or nine occasions at the site. We met with the council lady at the site. We've been very coordinated in our presentation to the neighbors. Uh, I'll also mention that the piece of property is at the corner of West End and Leonard. Uh, so you've got to be on an equitable basis to realize there's a 30 foot setback on West End. We're not asking for any variance from that at all. No deviation, no special exception. That would be honored as it faces West End. 
This is a special exception case, as I said. So basically, this board understands a special exception. Are you entitled to it? With respect to the conditions on the specific uh, conditions, there's two things. One is, is there a principal dwelling uh, that doesn't meet the minimum requirements? There is. That's eight feet. Nobody's going to dispute that. There's a second one about if there's a corner lot that doesn't meet the minimum requirements. That's a second predicate for a special exception. Eight minutes. I'm sorry? Eight minutes. Okay. There's nobody that's going to disagree. Those predicates are there. So once you establish that there's a predicate for a special exception, then the question is, what's the relief? We've asked for a five-foot setback. The staff of the planning department has exhaustively looked at it, did a three-page report. They clearly said that the setback was not only appropriate, it was in keeping with the policy, et cetera. So, the special exception requirement is there, and the appropriate relief is there. I'm going to ask for just a minute for Mr. John Nelly to step up, who lives right down the street, uh, and ask him to address that. Yeah, just right before you sit down, yeah, okay. Okay. so I was talking to Paul, and I'm with you on this special exception, but you all are relying on section 17.12.035. A, that's correct. A, and that is, and so that, that does allow the street setback to be Vary, but it doesn't say by how much. That's exactly right. And, that's, and your position is that's been vetted by Metro, and, and they're, they're okay with it. Correct. I mean, as you said, the first predicate is are we entitled to it? There's no dispute that we meet two of those requirements. So then, as you said, the key is what's the appropriate relief? We have proposed this five foot setback, and if you look at the three page report from the Planning Commission staff, without uh, covering every bit of what they said, they conclude by saying that the proposed setback of five feet along Leonard Avenue is in line with the setback intent of the policy to provide shallow setbacks and still allowing for a distinction between the private realm, the residence, and the public realm. That's the comments of the staff. So my answer to you is, with respect to the appropriateness of it, that's our argument, and it's obviously consistent with the uh, recommendation of planning, which is unequivocal about it being appropriate. Plus, you'll see that uh, there's a very large right-of-way here, and the right-of-way is such that this building will be uh, significantly, like 35 feet off the pavement. Uh, it'd be indistinguishable, and that's also covered by the engineer who's here, but that's, that's an argument, those two things. We're entitled to it, and the five feet is appropriate, period. All other issues we think raised about design, height, <coughs> There's nothing new in the matter here today. Uh, so I'll answer any other questions. Uh, so you, you're not asking for a rear setback variance. Didn't that, I think the rear setback was noted in the, the materials, but that, you're not asking, that was just for notification purposes. And then do you know how, um, yeah, if you were to draw a line from you know, the face of this building on Leonard kind of down to Quitlin, how far off are the houses? I think you mentioned that uh, uh, you mentioned that it was in your materials that the two houses are about nine feet from the setback line and you're going to be five feet. So is, there, is that right? There'll be a four foot difference between those homes and that's correct. your building? In fact, one of the houses as you get closer down to Whitworth is actually in the right of way. Okay. Uh, we're not arguing about that. But my answer to your question is, first of all, absolutely no relief at all except for the setback on Leonard. Nothing off West End, which is 30 feet. Nothing off the back of the property. That's it, and that's the only thing the staff planning looked at because that's all that we asked for. Okay, and then and then you and you just said and just for my intent, you you are saying you'll be 35 feet approximately from or more than 30 feet from the pavement. That's and correct. The, so and that so you were your argument was in your materials that that meets the spirit of the setback uh, of a 30 foot setback since in many cases the pavement is. Right, the pavement is right there, and in this case, it will still be at least 30 feet off the pavement, and that was the key thing that the staff of the planning department looked at when they when they recommended it without any reservation. But that that's the relief, and with respect to the other houses heading back south, would be the direction. They're well within that 30 feet, as you said. I think one's one's eight, one's five, and one of them is actually in the right of way itself. If there's no other questions at this point, uh, I'd like to ask John Nelly to make his comments, and then I've got one other witness. We've got two minutes for a button. Thank okay. <clears throat> Sir, can you come up, state your name and address, and then tell us your thoughts? Uh, my name is John Nelly. I live at 3801 West End Avenue, corner of 
Hardin in West End. I've lived there 35 years, probably longer than any other resident on West End. And it's a, my, I'm in a single story home. It's over 105 years old. Uh, on this existing property, that one in question, I walk by that most mornings because I walk uh, that, that area. The existing, I'm in support of the project, the existing property has insufficient parking. If you walk by there most mornings and afternoons, there's anywhere from three to five cars parked on both sides of, of uh, Leonard. So the current proposed project, is my understanding, has sufficient parking that hopefully will eliminate those cars and should hopefully make Leonard a little bit more safe. The second is the current project that's on there was built probably in the 50s and it's just not architecturally and landscape-wise in conformance with what's on West End with the current condos and historical homes there. So I think that this project should be, uh, should be a good project. I think it will be in conformity with what's uh, in the neighborhood. Okay, Mark, we can take a break and we can get sure. the rest with us in. Mr. Powell, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think Jessica's doing a yeoman's job today, keeping everybody going. That's right, that's right. Keep everyone She's probably too high to be a bouncer. That's right. Yeah, she's got to be on rocks. Right <laughs> 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 Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Chip Howard, SNH Group. Uh, I do not know what was already said, so I forgive, this if, forgive me if some of this is redundant. Um, I know Tom's covered a lot of this already, but I'm going to talk some more, more about it. Um, we're here uh, for a property located at 3717 West End and 101 Laird. Um the reason that we're here, what allows us to be here, is a couple of things. One is, is that we're inside the UZO, the Urban Zoning Overlay. Inside the UZO, there are certain uh, code allowances that allow uh, people to seek relief from setback requirements. If they're in the UZO, certain conditions apply via special exception. Um, so if I can get to, I don't know who's controlling, page 12 of the packet. We don't have the packet. Have I know y'all have a robust packet. If everyone could flip to page 12, that would be super helpful. It's a page that looks like this. It's got a red line on it. So we're at the property right here, top left. Um, as you can see, this property is unique because of the size of the right-of-way. There's a 70-foot right-of-way on Leonard off of West End. Um, somewhat similar to Whitland, but of course Whitland and Leonard are not the same. There's existing sidewalks along Whitland um, that make that perfect for that. Um, Leonard's a little bit different. So we're already, as you can tell um, from page, the diagram on page 12, our existing uh, property line is already 25 feet 9 inches off the existing right of way. So 25 feet 9 inches away from Leonard as it is. In Florida, I think it's page 56 or 363. Oh, sorry. I only had our specific package. Yeah, so. um, and if you continue looking at that property, right now there are sort of two, uh, two buildings on 3717 West End. One of which is nine feet two inches off the property line. Because the 3717 West End, as well as 101 Leonard, and uh, 3715 West End, which is on the other side of Leonard, are both zones R and 40, the setback, and because they're corner property, the setback on both the West End frontage and the Leonard frontage should be 30 feet. Um, as you can see from this, the one on 3715 West End, the front it is only 16 feet. Seven inches off the uh, right away line, and the existing building is nine foot two inches off the right away line. Moving down the street, um, you can see that there's two houses there. One actually has furnished on Woodland. That far south house on the left has furnished on Woodland. The one in between is 115 Leonard. So, in addition to our building at 101 Leonard, the only other property that actually has frontage on Leonard is 115 Leonard, um, which is sort of the white top one right there. Um, it is eight feet one inch off the existing right away. That zoning of that property is R8, so it is, should be 20 feet off the right away. Um, kind of continuing down, the two properties on the corner, of, just for example, for reference, the two properties at the corners of Whitland and Leonard 
are R8. Um, they both have front setbacks. They should be 20 feet off the right of way line on both Woodlands as well as Leonard. So in essence, all buildings that touch Leonard, none of them comply with the existing setback requirements for their zoning classification. Um, the next page in y'all's packet is just a Google image illustration of the same thing. You can't, it's harder to see, but you can see the red lines laid in. It just sort of shows how all the houses are really up close to the right-of-way line and, and how that condition exists. Two minutes remaining. So, her, and I'm going to let Tom get in the law uh, more. I know he did already. And at the end. Yeah, let's go. Okay. I have a question. Um, are you adding uh, on-street parking as part of your requirement? It looks like it is. So we are adding parking inside the right-of-way. We are taking the curb that exists right now, moving it into the right-of-way that exists near our, like at our property, and taking cars off where, where they currently park and moving them into the right-of-way that exists. And the right-of-way exists, why not use it? So is that moving your property line back further from the street than it normally would be? No, ma'am, that's already existing right-of-way. Right -of no, ma'am. Okay. Um, I know that time reserved two minutes. Uh, for at the end, so I'll, I'll be super quick. The next two pages um, are exhibits that illustrate the two special exception conditions that we would travel under per Tom's memo to the board. They illustrate both one, that the other property on Leonard, 115 Leonard, does not meet the existing setback uh, requirements, um, which is condition one of 17.12.350. And the next page is shows that the property across Leonard 3715 West End does not meet the setback exceptions, which uh, would travel under 17.12.350 uh, exception 2. And I'll stop there so it's common at the time. Uh, any other questions at this point? All right. Mr. Harvey, do you have anything there at this point, or do you want to save your time for a vote? I, I think we have a short time left in the first eight minutes, 30 seconds. Or am I we through at the eight minutes? We are. We're through. Okay. I got to save two minutes for both. Okay. All right. And, and any other questions from that at this time? Okay. So we will hear from the opposition. Thank y'all. All right. Thank you. I think we have some other neighbors on the outside who want to come in. Sure. I think we. If Jeff, are you leaving already? Um. I don't know. Go with yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So we'll we can bring two two more people in. Okay. I think that's all we have. Okay.
Uh, I'm Steve Kernute. I live at 224 Cardin Avenue. I'm not within a thousand feet of this. Uh, I happen to be the president of the Neighborhood Association. Uh, I'm not here in that capacity today. I've also lived in the neighborhood for 38 years, so I've seen a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, I have canvassed all the adjacent property owners, and without fail, they're all against it. Uh, the, the setback request allows for additional density, um, that they feel towers over them and they're all being dwarfed. And so I'm here on behalf of adjacent neighbors and uh, asking you to deny this request. Thank you. Hey, do you have any questions? Yeah. How, um, do you know how much taller this development is um, versus what's around it? Um, the height is, is governed by the scenic highway guidelines right now, so that, that's not something that's uh, being contested. You know, that said, I think 35 feet is the frontage height. Uh, this lot falls away toward the back, and when it slips to Heidi's house and other adjacent houses, the front is 35, the back has, is at least another 10 feet uh, higher. Are you asking what's there today? Yes. Well, that is what I'm asking. I realize, I realize myself deep in the properties that are in the neighborhood, how tall are they? I, I didn't the ask you questions. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the single family homes are, you know, one or two stories tall. The one that's on the, um, to the left. The multifamily that's to the left. Yeah. Yeah. How tall is that might be? Uh, Heidi, how tall? Is that where uh, Diane Neal lives? Yeah. Two stories? Yeah. And then the one next to that might be three stories? Yeah. So then when you, go, when you go down closer to uh, Bowling? Closer toward bowling, you've got, I mean, you've got, you know, that, that whole white hall towers over all the people on Whitland. I mean, it's not unusual for a, a big West End development to be much taller than the backyards of Whitland. I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily every home, but I mean, there are, there are, I mean, again, not making a case one way or the other, I mean, but that, that slope is impacted by you know, all of the yeah. developments, and there are plenty that are very tall. I think Whitehall impacts, uh, you know, Little Monticello behind it, pretty insulated. Um, I, I guess we just see, you know, it's kind of slipping down the slope, and uh, the rest of uh, all the West End going to Rugby right. is going to end up uh, being way denser than we would like. We would like to stick with the current guidelines. Okay, I have a question. I know you're not here in the role of the neighborhood president or neighborhood association, but I mean, it, it. What would be an amicable compromise for the neighborhood? Do you think in this, in this, if, if there was to be one, like what, you know? Because I, I mean, I, yeah, I, I would. I'm asking I would I'm suggest a lot of adjacent neighbors yeah. Yeah, play the biggest role in that, and yeah. um, the side setback allows for more density, and that pinches them. So if there was any way to stair step the back of the property or take it back inside the normal setback and build it to that density, um, again, I, I, I'd recommend adjacent owners having a bigger say in that. Isn't, isn't, the, isn't there, a, home, is there a, a building that's already on their property that they're keeping? Is that right? I mean, if they're, if they're making their 20 foot, I mean, I guess well, anyway, I'll, I'll ask you I, I don't. I think they're going to tear all three buildings down. Okay. And then just keep the land in between the. Yeah. Okay. The 20 feet. So there'll be a 20 foot setback in the back. So there'll be at least 20 feet between uh, the property line of the neighbor and the start of this construction for landscape buffers and that type of thing. Uh, I think that's my understanding. Okay. My name is Rick French, and I actually live uh, one house away from the intersection. And I was, I'm actually here to uh, give some uh, color from, based on some conversations from people without, they couldn't make it today, but they asked me to, uh, to speak on their behalf. And the main issue, I think, is that they want you to reject the request. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was 
they want you to reject the request for the variance okay. because it enables a, a new project, the new development, to increase in mass and size, which would be um, uh, detrimental to their properties, especially the most adjacent ones. And there's been a, uh, there are three properties or three buildings on the property right now, or the two lots. One of them complies with the 30-foot setback. The other one that's on the direct corner that's not. And that's the one that's about five feet off the right of way. The comparable corner piece. Uh, the, the uh, other piece that fronts West End and Leonard, like this piece, has a 21-foot setback from the right of way. And so I think that the, the um, feel at the intersection is totally different than what will happen with the mass, the increased mass on this section. And are, and you, are you saying that the mass will increase because of the setback that's being given? The setback... I'm trying to connect those two because they're, yes. they're asking for a, 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 essentially a setback. Right, they're asking to go for 30 feet to 5 feet, so how, how's that going to make a difference? How, that increases the building envelope substantially. So right, right now, the setback that's honored by the back duplex is 30 feet off the right of way. It's actually 35 feet off the right of way. They want to move their new building to 5 feet off the right of way. And, and so I they, that part. So they, they make it, well, are you saying it will allow them to make it taller, too? No, the height's the same. So, the so height. They, if, they, if they build it 30 feet in, they can go this, or if they, if they push it all the way to, they all go all the way back 30 feet, it can still be the same height. Correct, correct. But the difference will be uh, <laughs> that if, uh, if, if this were the, the new building envelope, the old building envelope is about two-thirds the size. So the people that are in the back, when the increased building envelope comes to Leonard, puts them behind the building. And also, the topography is unfortunate there, too, because it's also under the building. Mr. So, Mr. French, it sounds like, could you sort of talk more about that? It sounds like you're making an argument that this adversely impacts the neighbors that are behind the building, and so is... Well, there are actually two, uh, two points I'm trying to make. The first point is that there is no hardship other than they just want to increase the size of the building envelope, which will increase the profitability of the project, at the expense of the adjoining property owners who are in the back of the building. Now, the, unfortunately, there are people in the back here that will be more impacted. The people on this side, it's 35 feet regardless of what the um, Leonard's epic is so the, the people in the uh, western. How many? How many of that? I understand what you're saying. How many people will that be? You're, you're, if the building goes in more, or if it's out more, what you're saying is there more homes will be more, have a block. Right. So, so if how I'm, many if, is that? Uh, probably six people are severely impacted. That. If I, if, like imagine you go down Leonard and you stand at the intersection of Whitland and Leonard, this now is a new um, landmark that's visible from the people on Whitland, uh, their backyard is overshadowed by this new, new building and it can be moved back to the approved setback and it's much less impact than it is if it's Brought forward. I mean, I just. But uh, so what? But in terms of, I mean, when you say negative impact, is this aesthetic or is this, you know, the fact that somebody's looking at? I mean, what what is the what is the actual? Well, in your impact? special exceptions um, information, your your directive, I think, is not to issue variances if they if they impact uh, the adjoining property owner's light and. And uh, uh, well, that's for high. Uh, there, there is, there is a, 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 there is a, a kind of a vague uh, area 
okay, then we have the, the it's important, it's, but it, 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 it doesn't say, um, it does talk about impacting the neighbors, and so, um, well, it, 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 it did bring up the value, the, the value, uh, the property value issue. So if I'm, if I'm um, able to avoid having five stories behind me and right. not have five stories behind me, that clearly right. impacts my value. Well, and then that wasn't trying to be, I just, I just wanted to say, to, to hear you articulate more what, what that impact is, because it's, in, in the rules it's kind of vague to say what well, it impacts, but yeah. What is that impact? So that, okay. that, that's where I was. I wasn't trying to be argumentative. I just really wanted to say you don't have that chance to argue. Well, we right. have uh, specifically. We, you know, how is it? How is it going to impact the neighbors? Right. And and the, I'll be the first to admit it doesn't impact <coughs> many, but the few people that are directly impacted are severely impacted okay. in terms of their values and the quality of their life. I mean, this is a from the the Halpersons who live on the opposite corner will now have a direct sight line. If this is, now it's three stories up, and there's a debate about whether they're allowed to do the fourth rooftop, or you also have to count the, the topography, that's another level. They literally have a four-story lit tower behind them. That clearly is going to affect their value. Okay. And you're right, there are instances along West End where people have suffered with the uh, construction of a three-story building and they're below, right. but it's different because those buildings, and I've been involved in some of them, didn't ask for variances. They, didn't, they weren't enabled by the Board of Zoning Appeals to actually uh, enhance or, or make the problem work. Okay. I'm sure my time's up. <laughs> uh, then, uh, you know, when, when we ask questions, that kind of gets your time. So oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, can we get a, um, I don't have a question for you. We don't know if we can make it work. Yeah, we're having <laughs> trouble with the connection. Oh, okay. We, we are technically challenged today. <laughs> when we yeah. pause, we will try to connect everything. Well, I mean, you all may be able to answer off the top of your head, you know, John and Jessica, but when we look at special exceptions, we look at sometimes for height and then sometimes for street setback. And, in the sh and I wish I had my notebook here because I could read it myself, but when um, you have the street setback is one of the conditions that you're allowed to have the street, the, the building be closer to the street, provided that you don't impair the light and air and other things that go on adjacent, adjacent properties. And I, sorry, I wish I had my notebook to read that, but am I remembering that correctly? I have that range. The short answer to your question is you're referring back to, and has been referenced previously, 1716 150, which is the general provisions language for any special exception. No, not that one. But that is, that is important to you. May, may we read that in? Because it's come up yeah. more than once, has been gently stated, incorrectly cited. Uh, part C of that general provision language, integrity of adjacent areas, reads as follows. A special exception use permit shall be granted, provided that the board finds that the use is so designed located and purposed to be operated that the public health, safety, and welfare will be protected. I'm only reading that in substantive part there because I think that's a language that sometimes intellectually broadened. We sometimes read a little more into that, but it is, again, the three components, uh, public health, safety, and welfare. Um, you, of course, as board members, determine what that includes and what it does not. Um, there is no specific language in the section 1712, what, 035 that we're dealing with for the special exception provision for the setbacks here on this multifamily development. It doesn't talk about the specifics of, uh, what part am I looking for, Lisa? D. Uh, D2. D2. Um, uh, let's see, an applicant shall provide evidence to the board that the proposed building setbacks shall not create an adver adverse impact on adjacent properties in order to track from a strong pedestrian friendly environment. And that's probably the specific language you're looking for. So the board then has the charge of determining whether or not the evidence put before you uh, demonstrates the absence of an adverse impact on adjacent properties. I think Mr. Taylor's questions went to that pretty pointedly. And then also that it shall not detract from a strong pedestrian friendly environment. Fortunately, with the teeth of uh, the city's sidewalk law now in effect, virtually no project has the opportunity to truly detract from a strong pedestrian friendly environment. 
to the extent there are any other, are any other questions for us as a staff, we're happy to take those. I sometimes have to remind the board, or choose to remind the board, this is a special exception about setback. There is no change in what is allowed for the height, the floor area ratio, the impervious service, uh, service ratio, or any other bulk regulation. Therefore, however tall it could have been, it can still be. However much floor area ratio could have been, or how much ISR could have been, it could still be, at least under the terms of the bulk regulations. So the decision for you to make is that whether or not you've got the conditions necessary to approve the special exception for the setback reduction. Again, happy to answer any questions if the board members have. I have one. Mr. I'll ask Mr. White the same question. I'll follow on the provision because I think it is the, the provision everybody's focusing on, and it is about the height of the floor area ratio. Is that the integrity of the adjacent areas? And what it talks about is whether or not it will impair the reasonable long-term use of those properties. Is there, are you aware of any case law that equates long-term use with uh, property value? Because those are different words to me. It's, different they're, they're different for a reason. And the inclusion of the word use in that ordinance is very pointed. Because the use of the property, it's kind of like when you read law on uh, takings. If, the, if a property is rendered devoid of value by a government taking, for example, expansion of a highway or something like that, the compensation works differently for the uh, person whose property is being taken in a condemnation proceeding than if it were merely reduced in value, reduced in size, reduced in scope. So the, again, the word use here is very pointed in that has the uh, property in question had its reasonable use of the property taken away? Valuation is never treated as an apples to apples comparison there. So there's, you're, you're not aware of any, any uh, case law that in determining the impairment of the reasonable long term use that, that takes into account any kind of loss in I won't speak to whether I can cite to any. I cannot cite to any case law one way or the other as to whether value is considered as part of that analysis. But I'm not. I'm definitely not aware of any case law where value is the whole of that analysis, where that is the uh, value equals what's the phrase uh, reasonable use. I suppose in that particular context. Thank you, and Mr. Law. I do have a question. Well, you, you read the two sections and. In the preambles of the sections at the very beginning, it says, shall be granted. Am I correct in that? That goes back to the general, yes. That goes back to the general concept of special exception. The first ordinance I read to you talked about the general provisions of any special exception case. Now, as you know, the older lawyers had it right when they used the term conditional use permit for what we now call, because state law uses this term, special exceptions. It sounds like somebody's getting away with something in that phrasing. But it is, in fact, treated the exact same as the old conditional use permit. If you meet the conditions, then you get the permit. Right. The way it's handled by law is different than a variance. Whereas a variance under both our zoning code and under state law, specifically 137200 and following, describes the fact that in order to get a variance, you have to demonstrate the hardship and meet all the conditions, and that's how you get a variance from a board of zoning appeals anywhere in the state of Tennessee. With a special exception, or again, the old conditional use permit, um, if the applicant demonstrates that he or she meets the conditions, then the board shall grant that approval. It is no longer a discretionary call for our board if the board determines that they meet those conditions. And that's the discretionary component. Do I think that this is a project that does preserve, preserve uh, public health, safety, welfare? Do I think this is a project where the request that they're making does meet the requirement about not creating an adverse impact on adjacent properties in order to attract from a strong pedestrian friendly environment. But if then, if yes, then you're kind of done. You gotta vote yes at that point. If no, then you vote no. So although there is discretion in it, that discretion does not exist if in fact the board finds that you've met those terms. Other questions? Any other questions for the I think I, I think I telegraphed part of how I think Mr. White's gonna be approaching it and hopefully telegraphed it, Council One, for you a little bit. Happy Not that I'm only one of a few. Well, and I hope that we bring out that makes a little bit clear where I was going with the questioning to say that 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 often the, the other criteria, you know, again that is in the presentation that was made, um, the other, a lot of the other criteria I mean, we haven't discussed it, but they, they made a strong case that hey it meets these and, and where you all are coming in is to say, no, here here's the specific adverse effect that we believe and then our board has to weigh, well, is that, is that uh, in line with, with yeah, well, what Yeah, well, if I could, just humor me for one second, because I'm confused. 
So this, the, according to the, the, the Tennessee Code of Ordinances, it says that there is, uh, that the board shall not grant a variance without finding the following. One is those. Well, this things. isn't a variance. This is a special exception, and so there's no. Yeah, but more. it's under the special exception okay. section, and it says that the granting of the variance will not be injurious to other property or improvements in the area, impair the adequate supply of light air to adjacent property, or substantially diminish or impair property values within the area. So, it's it's saying that that you can not grant the variance if it does any of those things. Now, that, then we're de going to debate about whether their property values are going down because there's this new, uh, they're now in a hole and they're behind a building and whatever. The other, uh, the other criteria that they claim is that the, it cannot be granted, you cannot grant a variance if financial gain is not the sole basis for granting the variance. Now this goes back to what you, you should said. to what section you were reading. For this no, no, not to me, to the board. Oh, have a vote today. oh okay. Um, 1740, 370 review standards. That's the metro code. Well. But, uh, but this. Uh, that's the metro code. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think that's a special exception. It's not the same special exception for the reason I'm reading. Because I was thinking about, for example, impairing life. I just see impair the reasonable long term use of the property. So well, I think we need to put our legal counsel on the hot seat. The citation made is to the Metro Code of Laws, not to the state law. The state law outlines it two separate set parts of the 13-7 statute. And Mr. White, if you happen to have your copy of 208 handy, I'll be happy to follow it. Otherwise, I'll fetch my own. But under the state law, there are different sections that outline the way that special exceptions are handled and then the way that variance cases are handled. They are not the same. Relief can be granted for both, but they are not the same thing and don't have the same criteria for review. Similarly, our, our city law, the Metro Code of Ordinances, which was just cited to by Mr. Prince in section 40, outlines how we do variances and special exceptions following basically the state law, almost word for word. Nevertheless, to read from the provisions of the variances, effectively for me to get up and read you from Moby Dick, it's not what we're doing here today. Special exception and special exception criteria. 1716-150, and if you want to go to integrity of adjacent areas, that's part two in the first section there. Yep. Or part C. Sorry about that. I want to be on the right side. I'll go back to law school. <laughs> so I think that, that it still comes back to the point of it's it, they're obviously entitled to develop the property. There's going to be the, the height that they're allowed to do. They're allowed to do a lot of things. But the one thing that doesn't seem fair is that you grant them more uh, favors or more benefits than the people that are living in the adjacent process. So would you would you uh, think that it would be appropriate to have a nine foot variance, uh, which is where we would put it in line with the adjacent properties instead of a five foot variance? I'm, I shouldn't be the one that's asked. I think the adjacent property owners to that property should be the ones that are going to tell the developer, ask the developer to negotiate with them. Okay. I, I don't know what, you know, it, it, it's totally out of thin air that they chose five feet. I mean, they could have asked for two feet, you know, as the final setback. But the, the most uh, similar case is 21 feet, which is the other corner. Okay. Can, can I just, were the public hearings, Councilman? Did, were there public hearings on this? Because I'm just trying to. Okay. You did have a community meeting. I figured you. Oh, but the the day, but the, the the notice please, notice sir, would you mind? I can I can address the. the yeah, I figured you could. I, I was just because we're 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 doing a whole lot of conjecture here, and I'm not trying to cut anybody short, but okay, I was just. Yeah, no, that, that, well, that was an answer to the question. I asked the question of what he thought he deferred to the neighbors, which is his answer. So that that's perfectly fine. Uh, but, so. Is there time left for there's any other opposition want to speak or address anything that's been said? Okay, so then now we'll turn it over to uh, Council. Well, then, Councilor Mark, did you want to speak now before Mr. White rebuts? I can. I'll give you your two minutes. Go ahead. And then I'll, then I'll bring us all home. Okay. Thank you. I'll be very brief. Uh, number one, as was 
cited the language says it shall be granted. That's the difference between a special exception and, and basically a variance. There's still total incorrect references being made to the language on a variance and hardship. It's not before the board. The language says it shall be granted. With respect to parking, we are over parking the site. That can be absolutely committed to. It's in the drawings. In addition, we're taking some traffic off of Leonard and taking it off to the side, which is going to help the traffic action there at West End and Leonard. With respect to the height, height's not an issue here. We're mandated by the Scenic Highway Act. It's 35 feet. And for someone to argue that if it's 35 feet and only two-thirds or three-fourths of the size uh, is an impact on use, I think it's not credulous. But basically, we're limited with 35 feet. With respect to public health, safety, and welfare, I can't imagine somebody making an incredible argument. That's not the case. Uh, with respect to the language, it's impairing the long-term use. How can somebody credibly say it's impacting the long-term use of their property? Uh, there's any number of other buildings from Whitehall to other along the route, but this is in keeping, and we cannot exceed, we're not exceeding or requesting any relief from anything other than a setback on Leonard. With respect to the neighborhood meeting, I want to comment. My clients met out there eight or nine times. I met the council lady and talked with her repeatedly about it. Uh, she's been very gracious with her time, and I want to be very clear that with respect to the matter of being heard, we agreed to defer this when I was requested by the council lady, I think a day or two before we were last scheduled. It was last minute, but I understand how people are busy. We agreed to defer to today. That's how we got here today. But we did that. We did a Zoom call with the neighbors, which the council lady was kind enough to coordinate. But again, the language is, shall be granted if you comply. This is the special exception. Nobody's going to dispute that we meet the two items I referenced, the eight foot on the principal residence and the building across the street, which is 20 instead of 30 feet. We meet those. So the question is, what does the staff say? The staff concluded saying it should be utilized on review of the zoning overlay. And then the, 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 planning, the planning department made a recommendation. That they, the planning department recommends a, uh, makes a recommendation on all special exceptions, and they recommended that we approve this. They did, and they the specifically not just said approve it, they said approve the five feet because it's consistent with the policy. Okay. Uh, taking into account the very things we talked about, the use and other things, there's a three-page report from planning where they very thoroughly looked at it and addressed every issue that was raised here today. And we so just, just one uh, question on the, uh, that was raised by the opposition in terms of uh, impact, how did, uh, neighborhood impact or, or, or impact on the neighbors, what, how, what is your response to, uh, to their concerns about the negative impact that the project may have? Well, I have to be as considerate as I can be. I live very close to that neighborhood. If you look at what's on the property right now, and those three buildings will come down. They're 1950s, as Mr. Nelly said. They're not well kept up. Uh, there's cars totally on the street in front of Leonard for our people that are parking there. So I just can't imagine how somebody would think that an eight, uh, a three-story, uh, eight-unit uh, condominium wouldn't be a huge increase in property values for everybody in that road. Uh, I just I don't think, that as Mr. Nelly and others said, why would somebody oppose it? I mean, it, it cleans up the area. It's good. It takes care of a traffic problem as you come from West End and turn out Leonard, which is kind of a funnel right now. It's like a chute. It's going to help with that by getting cars off the road, those vehicles in front. And then, as I said, we're overparked all underneath parking there. So we're asking for no variance of any sort. We're asking for a special exception, which is strictly coming off of Leonard Avenue for five feet. It'd be the same distance from the pavement that it is right now. So it's, a, it's, so it's an eight unit condominium, which I don't think we've just been. That's correct. And that's the plans that Mr. Holbrook showed. I mean, we'll answer any questions, but yeah. Mr. White, I'm, I'm a, and I think I'm, I'm on record, I'm a big tree guy, and I'm a big green area type person. And I'm just sort of looking at your site, and I'm seeing an awful lot of where you have parking, but I don't see a heck of a lot of trees and what have you. Help me out here. Because yes, absolutely. that's an impact for the people in terms of environment or what have you, because it's air quality. The client is totally committed to that. What we've done is there are some trees that are already in that corridor that we're discussing. We are making an application right now for a sidewalk uh, before the appropriate sidewalk committee. You know, that's now done informally by a group of people from different departments uh, instead of appearing in front of the BCA. What we have proposed, and I've said this to the council lady, what we're willing to do, we're willing to preserve all the trees that are there now and do a meandering sidewalk. 
so that they're kept in place. We're willing to do that. We've made that commitment. If, in fact, the neighbors and the council lady don't want the trees there, we'll take them down and do a standard sidewalk. We'll do either of the two. And I've been unequivocally clear to the council lady that we would do either one of those. So we are very sensitive. Our preference, frankly, is to leave the trees in place. Uh, there's trees that are of some size. I'm not an arborist. I can't tell you the quality of the trees, but they're there. We want to preserve them. They've been there a long time. So we've actually made that application for, this, for the sidewalk relief we're talking about. But again, if somebody doesn't want us to do that, we'll go ahead and build the sidewalk as it is now. That's not our preference. But again, we'll do what we're asked to do by Metro. I've got some questions about the rendering, which I'm not able to, <laughs> able to see. But what I'm looking at looks like a about a three and a half, um, three stories with a half story on top of those penthouses, or I don't well, know how that yes. gets within the 35 I can get close enough to see this. Sorry. Okay. No, we are very clearly aware of the 35-foot restriction, and we're making the categorical commitment, whatever is interpreted on the 35 feet, we'll do that. There's some debate as to whether or not a rooftop or canopy, you know, whether that counts or doesn't count. Whatever is determined by Metro will comply. Uh, but again, I've seen other matters where there's a, a little area on top, which is amenity for the neighbors. Uh, and for people within the building. If, if we're not allowed to do that, we just won't do it. Uh, but it was a conceptual drawing that Mr. Howard, the SNH, did. I think it's extremely attractive, but if there's any doubt, we'll not ask for any relief on the height. It's 35 feet, period. It's yep. very attractive, but um, I also wanted to ask about, you said eight units, and what's the square footage of those units? And I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Eight. Yeah, sorry, it's hard to hear. <laughs> the square footage of each unit, there's eight units. I'm just wondering about what are, what are the size of these condos? I'm very sorry, I don't know. Uh, they're large. Uh, they look but, large. But I do not know uh, the exact square footage, I'm sorry. And then is the, um, yeah. the, the rendering shown, is that, uh, that is the plan? You, you said conceptual drawing, and so, I mean, I, I, I often, you know, to me, special exceptions, because they have neighborhood meetings and planning, and, you know, uh, and they don't have to prove the hardship that a variance does, I, I tend to, if, if the board approves, I tend to propose, and some, I think most time people agree, sometimes they don't, that, uh, that it be tied to the project as presented, and, and the renderings, again, without, with or without the, the top based on whether or not you can do it, but if it deviates from that rendering, then you need to come back because I don't think that, in my opinion, again, it's not necessarily a part of it, but I usually like to tie it. Yeah, I think if, if you change it from what you say you're going to do, the, the, the neighbor should have another shot at saying the uh, impact. We do not have a problem with that, Mr. Chairman. In fact, I want to make the comment that some of the neighbors made the comment that perhaps instead of the exact architecture elevations that we've got, that maybe a bit of a brownstone in certain parts might be more attractive. Now, that's not the province of this board at all, but I want to be candid and say that issue came up, and my client said we would look at that and explore. Uh, we're willing to do that. But the FAR will not change. The setback, will, none of that will change at all. So if, it, if it's basically, if it is approved, conditioned upon that, uh, I don't have any problem with that being the case. But we need to make sure that uh, the FAR is not going to change, the setback won't change, uh, and again, I just want to be sensitive to the fact that when we say sidewalk, trees, we'll do whatever you want to do, uh, we're, we're that flexible. Uh, and the same thing has to do with the elevation on this building in that we think it's particularly attractive. Uh, but if there's some request that we do some type of brownstone application, we're open to that. So as long as it's that structure that we're identifying, Mr. Chairman, we don't have any problem with that. That's not going to change. Okay. Yes. I, pre I appreciate it. I, I, I have one more question. Yes, so, um, like this, this rendering shows a, a canopy on the exterior of the building. Is that five foot, and this may be a better question to verify with staff, is that five foot uh, setback to the edge of the canopy or to the edge of the building? But they're uh, asking one of the current plan. A permit application has not been started, so okay. the full site review has not okay. been done. Gotcha. There will be nothing in that five feet. Okay. Uh, I appreciate your courtesy. We respectfully ask that it be approved as the language says shall be granted. That's our argument.
appreciate your courtesy and time. I will comment about any other, any other questions, Mr. White? Right, thank you. No, no youth and inexperience will be held against the question today earlier. <laughs> All right, now we'll hear from uh, Councilor Eddie Harvey. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, my name is Councilwoman Kathleen Murphy, currently of 805 South Wilson. Um, soon be back at my house at 231 Orlando. Um, and, but that gives me kind of a unique perspective and let me kind of share with you this area of, of, of my district. And I know some of you have heard this story from me before and know this area very well. But um, the important part of uh, the West End Corridor that I think one of the reasons why it is so sought off after, and one of the reasons why we don't have a corridor like West End anywhere else in Nashville anymore, where you have these stately homes, um, and whether they be a manor house that is multifamily, or whether they still be a single family home, the reason we don't have those on Gallatin Pike anymore, out on Lebanon Road, uh, towards Donaldson and Hermitage anymore, is because of the scenic highway. And I have to credit uh, former, or, uh, former Senator uh, Douglas Henry and my father, when he was a state representative in the 70s, put into place the scenic highway along West End. And they did that because the Ropey um, apartment complex, just a little bit further down from this property, was too tall, in their opinion, uh, and so they, they passed it. It is state law. And so while I think it's mighty kind of the applicant to say at the community meeting and here today that they will not seek a height variance, it is impossible to seek a height variance on this property without changing the state law. Um, and we had a commitment from our current state representative about the, a similar property on West End that they would not be willing to change the scenic highway along here. And while I can't speak for him today, I will tell you that in the past he said that he is not willing to change that scenic highway. Why is the scenic highway important here? It's also important because it extends either direction um, a certain number of feet. So it caps the height at 35 feet at the scenic highway at West End, and then it extends into the neighborhoods. And that's another reason why Whitland and Richland West End are two neighborhoods that have really retain their historic neighborhood uh, contextual uh, and, and historic layout is because of those protections that have been there since the 70s. And why when you think of the West End Corridor, you think of kind of deeper lots, deeper setbacks, um, and homes that are on larger lots, and appropriately so. And so that kind of leads to when we allow for this um, special exception, that is in the code, it takes from where a home or a structure would be centered or more, um, depending on which way you look at it, away from that side street having that deeper setback on one end, what it does is it, 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 it does make a wider building. So instead of having, you know, your three layer cake on there that's a full size, without the relief they're seeking, you still have that setback and half of that cake there. And the, the view from the interior of the neighborhood towards West End, and West End does slope down towards Whitland, slopes down along Leonard, roughly we're guessing around 10 feet. Um, and when you're looking up at West End, you no longer would have somewhat of a panoramic view that widens as you're looking at West End. It will now be more narrow on one side because this uh, structure will be a big chunk of, pro of, of a building there. And so, so that's kind of to give you a little bit more context of where we are. Um, we did have a community meeting. Uh, it was over WebEx, so Metro hosted it. Um, I did just get that link, I think, yesterday afternoon. Uh, we did have question and answer on it, but it wasn't necessarily due to COVID, the situation where we could have the real back and forth that you would have expected with a community meeting. But again, this is not a zoning uh, request here. This is not your typical uh, thing that I hear as a member of the planning commission where we can negotiate those things. 
we're at the BZA where they make an offer to you and the neighbors don't really get to negotiate that out. And I'll get to that later in, in some of the options that I would suggest for y'all on a menu today. Um, I think that the renderings they have shown you today really, quite frankly, don't matter worth it at all. Um, held myself back there. <laughs> uh, uh, I appreciate the chairman's uh, consideration that these renderings be somewhat quasi-attached as if an agreed order, but at the end of the day, um, the, the, unless they have changed, they don't appear to change from the community meeting uh, that we held last week, they are not accurate to the 35 feet scenic highway uh, height restriction. And so, so there is no way that, that a building, um, it, unless they have changed what they have provided you, it is not an accurate drawing. Um, Mr. White said himself that they are willing to change and soften the exterior, which is something I requested. Uh, if you are accustomed or travel this corridor often, you'll, you'll know that recently, uh, about five years ago, the, the Baptist College up the street sold and um, uh, the Ford development did extremely nice townhomes there uh, and that was done through an SP for other reasons but it retained the scenic highway and other setback requirements and things and was done brownstone style fits in beautifully um, so again I would love to see some written agreements attached to this order um, if it were to pass but I'll get to that again in a minute but at the end of the day, the renderings and the site plan shown to you today is not accurate, and I would not count on them because they simply have not calculated out. So while it might be nice to have those rooftop amenities, I don't believe that they will be able to have them unless they come down significantly to meet the scenic highway um, 35 feet limit. Um, so the parking that they uh, talked about, while Leonard, um, we have gone back and forth talking about parking on Leonard with the neighbors. And I do think that um, personally getting those cars off where they park now on the street and moving them off into kind of still in the right of way, but kind of tucked in um, and allowing for more of a structured street entrance there, while I think that is nice, um, that is something that I think still needs to be fleshed out and really should not be a consideration of the board today. It is something that would be done in the right of way and um, as as Mr. White uh, even it, it, uh, conceded, it has not yet been approved and the sidewalk has not been approved, the, the alternative design by the public works. There's At first it was, that's I'm sorry. Not before today, right? None of that's before us. None of that's before you right. today, but it has been presented as part of the package to you today. So I just want to make sure that while that's nice and I think it should be uh, considered by the neighbors at another point, um, it is currently denied by Public Works and should not be part of your, your um, decision-making process today. So again, I think that uh, the trees have been brought up as well. Um, I love to see some of those trees remain. Uh, some of them are in the right-of-way, the ones on Leonard, and uh, the alternative sidewalk that's being proposed would uh, hope to save them, but again, that is not a guarantee, and that's something that should be if they come down and building should be replaced with similar caliber and I would I would like to see that as part of a written agreement. Um, again, that's kind of the menu that I'll get to at the end. Um, I do feel that the, the height and the rear setback um, requirements and other requirements on this property that, that are restrictive on this property because it is a corner lot, they knew that when they purchased this and it should be developed within, within the existing um, requirements and, and kind of pattern guidelines and envelopes that are developed by the code and the bulk standards. Um, I'm sorry, I don't understand. You said something about the rear setback, but I mean, they're only asking for this setback on Leonard, so was there, was that a general comment or was there a specific aspect of this that you're saying they should comply with? I'll go 50-50 with you on that one. So while yes they are, they're not asking for any difference of that 20 foot setback. It does require I think about a five foot landscape buffer because you're going from multifamily to single up to, to R15 R in the back. Or right, R10. They're not asking for any type of... They're not asking for relief, but the thing is is even when you have that 20 foot, so if you have that 20 foot and you still keep that 30 foot setback that's required by the code, when you move that 30 foot setback, then that is a larger building that the neighbors on Whitland will be looking at. 
their view shed of what would be a skinny building is now a wide building. And 20 feet is simply not enough of a scale ratio to make that justify how wide that building is going to be looking at of their view shed being taken away if this is this, this relief is granted. Okay. Um, so again, the, the wider building um, means that there's going to be more building, uh, more windows, more overlook into neighbor's property. That takes away not just their light and air access from that direction, but it takes away their privacy. And there are actually 14 children that live adjacent to this. So while it is just a few family, they, uh, they are very uh, active with the youngsters around there. And so the concern is, is that just privacy in general is going to be taken away um, because that view shed and access to what would be their sky plane, it is now building. Um, so that is how one of the main reasons how this adversely impacts the adjacent properties. And I think that's one of the areas that you can have discretion in and should take advantage of it. Um, another thing that has been mentioned is the pedestrian landscape. And um, while it was a few months ago, well, it all runs together, it was pre-COVID, this neighborhood and I were before you regarding a fence um, and determination of how tall a fence can be, if you remember that. And we talked a lot about the pedestrian feel of how tall a fence is when you're walking on a sidewalk. And so while this, pro this project will require sidewalk improvement, thus improving the, the pedestrian, uh, it, enhancing the pedestrian accessibility and feel there, that's not the whole story. Because where you would think that they would still have that setback, that building is still very tall near the pedestrian. And so while you have a nicer sidewalk to lock, walk along, you're going to have a much taller building than required by the bulk code if you, um, if you grant this relief to them. So whereas you would have 30 feet between the sidewalk and, and the building, you'll now have five feet before you hit a 35 to, to 45 potentially tall building. So it will be towering over pedestrians in that way. So again, while they say they seek relief, again, it's relief that is not guaranteed, even though it is part of the code, it is up to y'all to have it. If this was guaranteed relief, we wouldn't be here today. So, uh, and just kind of circling back, I wrote multiple notes clearly in different ways, that five feet is just simply not enough space between the public and private realm, even with the, in, the upgraded sidewalk. Um, so, Let's see, uh, the right-of-way, it is a very large right-of-way along Leonard. It is 70 feet wide, um, but again, that is metros to develop at any given time if for some reason we wanted to increase it or not. And so I'm not sure um, exactly how we want to play into that today, but I think just simply the fact that we have a wide right-of-way here is not justification to reduce their setback from the current pavement. You know, in, in five years, 10 years, or 100 years, Metro might want to extend this from a two-lane road to a much wider road. Or Metro might choose itself to put parallel parking in the right-of-way on both sides of the road. And therefore, this right-of-way where right now it feels like you're still gonna be 30 feet off the, from the street pavement, if Metro were to choose to put um, a complete street here, then it no longer feels like 30 feet from the pavement, it would be reduced. And that is, that is Metro's discretion at any time. So again, the sight line, I don't know if they included in y'all's packet that you can look at, but you can see roughly the sight line from Leonard that I mentioned before, where again, you see a wide view shed, it'll be much more narrow. Um, so I think really my main points that I've wandered around to are that the drawings you're seeing today, while they are pretty, they are nice, they are much better than I can do with my crayon markers. Um, they are not an accurate reflection of what could be built here. And, and I understand that. They're not asking for a variance of, or presenting a site plan. They're just asking for that setback reduction. But I do think, to the chairman's point, that it would be nice to have accurate uh, site plan 
elevations and, a, and an idea. So what specifically will fill is not accurate besides the possibility of a roof or a, a roof feature or not? The height to the back, even though it scales down 10, um, they, they have not provided that where the height will be. They weren't even sure, the, at the, as of the community meeting last Wednesday, that the front met the 35 foot or that any of that on the top would be part of that 35 feet. Under the scenic highway law in the state code, it states nothing can be above that. But they, they testified today that they would meet, the, meet that. So okay. Right, but the drawings show you something that do not meet the 35 feet. And so I appreciate and would like for accurate drawings to be attached to whatever, you, if you choose to, to approve this today, but what, I'm, but what I'm challenging you, I guess, is that it's going to be difficult or we're going to be right back here in a few months if you attach that to the order saying you have to do that. They can't do what they are showing you. And so I guess those are kind of my four options. Is one, just deny this because it, it is not necessary. It, it does not, um, it, they haven't met both conditions. There so is an adverse effect. I'm sorry? Which condition did they not meet? I do not feel that it meets the condition to not adversely impact other properties. I do not think that it, um, I think it adversely impacts the pedestrian um, realm. And so I think that's one reason to deny this. I think another option you have is to defer this until they uh, can develop an accurate site plan to attach to it or defer this until... Uh, they, have, I'm sorry, that they have an accurate site plan. Are you talking about an accurate elevation? I mean, the, I mean, the site plan where the building sits isn't going to change regardless of how tall it is. I mean, it it could change. Can get Their project might need to change if they can't go as tall as they need. I mean, developers tell me that all the time. If we can't get the height, then we'll have to go wider. If we can't go wider, then we have to go taller. Right, but we're not, but we're not here to, to give them right. blanket permission for that. We're, we, are, we are constraining an envelope today. So that, that, that's the site, that's where the building sits, that's the site plan. If they can choose to go smaller if they want to, or come out to where we say, but this, I mean, to me it sounds more like the elevation may change, what it looks like and how, and how this, the, the floors work, but not the site plan itself, because that's that's fixed by whatever, you know, but it's fixed now by code, and it's fixed, it could be fixed differently if, if we approve the special exception. But we don't know if their project is viable if they can't do the heights that they have been attempting up until last week when I told them they didn't need the scenic highway heights. Um, I don't know if their project is, is viable and they might need to come back and ask for, you know, less than five feet. So again, until they work out those numbers, I, I don't think, I think this should be deferred for that reason too. Um, so to have more accuracy across the board there, or to defer it or give them a, a more shallow setback. But, I mean, if they don't, if they don't know what their footprint is to build under, how can they figure out if the project's viable or not? I, mean, I, think, I think we need to give them some parameters to work with there. I mean, I, I, that's well, that's where I think they put the cart before the horse and they should have deferred. Um, as of last week at the community meeting, they didn't know uh, how tall they could go. They had that calculated incorrectly. Um, and so right now, if, if, unless they've had that recalculated and not presented it more clear today, and I missed it, uh, if they thought they were, could, could, could go with the things on top, with the patio on top, that may change the whole rest of the project. Um, and so, you know, one measurement changes somewhere, then the, other, the rest of the project may change too. And I think it's preliminary for them to even be requesting just five feet. I think that they should have no more of what their project's going to look like with the five foot setback before they should come to you. Councilwoman Murphy, I guess I'm hearing two things from you, and I just want to make sure I've got them on because I've got an ordinance saying, uh, and a statute saying, you shall grant it if thus and such, and then you have our discretionary area in there, 
And what I'm hearing from you, and I do give great deference to the members of the council that take the time that you have today, just like I do with Mr. White, what they're presenting isn't a complete presentation, is what you're saying. And I'm going to grope a little bit. I'm, I'm, I can see an impact to the health of the surrounding owners. And, and I'm, I don't know if Mr. White has any more time to come back up here or, or not. And I sort of forewarned you earlier, and I mean, I, I'm only one of six, but uh, 30 foot, you're right, staring at it going, that's what I was kind of looking up just a minute ago, and that's a whole lot more going up there, and it's going to affect the air quality, there are more people in the neighborhood, and things like that. Is that what you're going for? Because that's, in my mindset, is, you know, I talk about trees and I talk about that type of stuff, but we're now talking air quality and those types of things, and, I, and density and carbon footprint and all the other, and no, I'm not a new Green Deal person, but I, I do. I never accuse you of that. No, I don't think you, that's probably one of the you safest things you do. But, but I, I think you understand, and, and I do hope the chairman will allow Mr. White to at least come back, but I'm having, I don't see discretion unless I'm, well, that's, that's where I am. And that's up to the board, and I, I think that's a, a wise idea, but we'll, we'll address that in a second to see if we want to hear more, because I do think that uh, by the council lady going uh, last and raising issues that could most likely, uh, at least if not be answered, be addressed, to, for us to decide if they're answered uh, is probably appropriate. Um, you know, and, and, I, and I may be way off base. I mean, I. Uh, well, I know, I, I know that we, we want to be uh, respectful of everybody's time and manage it, but it's, a, it's an important project. It's important to the neighbors. It's important to the person who owns the property, the developer. And so I, 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 I don't object, and, and again, it will be up to our board to decide uh, to have a little bit more flexible uh, back and forth, but again, with respect to, to, uh, to, the, to the time. Uh, the rationing, and, and I know we've got a lot of the folks in a lot of the cases waiting too, but again, I, I don't want to uh, just, uh, I, don't, I don't want to create a situation where the information wasn't allowed to be shared that was available. Right. But, but, but back to my question, uh, is, is that the thrust, of, at least in part of your argument, that there will be a substantial or at least some adverse impact based upon density additional people, the, the concrete, the, the whole nine yards. I, that, right. that's, I'm assuming that's where you are. Okay. Right. If you grant the relief sought by the applicant, then the pedestrian, the road, uh, anyone traveling down Leonard or living in the area, instead of having a um, skinny, taller building, will have a wide, taller building. And what that it does is it makes it closer to the street, it makes it closer to the sidewalk. Um, and then at the end of the day, there are other options to this building envelope that, that could be developed. Um, instead of loading it all on one side, um, stair-stepping in different ways, instead of simply dropping a, 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 a square on this property, I think, I think the developer could, have, could get a little bit more creative that could make at least some more neighbors uh, feel a little bit more comfortable with this. So I'm happy to answer other questions. Yeah, I guess the only other you know, question, I mean, you know, I'm very familiar with the, the neighborhood. Um, you know, my parents and my grandparents used to live a few blocks away uh, for a long, long time. So, I, I mean, I've really been going to this neighborhood, uh, I don't want to say how long it would be my whole life, but you know, it's a long time. Um, but I guess, to me, the, the height, and I raised it with uh, with one of the neighbors a minute ago, but, you know, there's no shortage of really, you know, three-story to four-story buildings that look down in all the backyards on Flintland. I mean, you know, my entire life, you couldn't, well, actually, you know, I remember when they built Whitehall, and it was 40-something years ago, I think, and, you know, there's an eight-foot wall in the back of my, you know, parents' corner of property that, leveled out their property and three stories on top of that. And you could have anything in your backyard with the 10 families or whatever living there that if they were on their back porch. I mean, there's the privacy issue I understand, but it's not uncommon at all on that street. 
for there to be towering buildings on, uh, relatively towering buildings on West End to the downhill neighbor. And so, and I, I don't disagree with you there. The yeah. part that I disagree with is that what makes this property different and why they are seeking this relief is that it's a corner lot. And the corner lot, even though the, the single family homes are close, they have, I think the diagrams have shown, and the surveys have shown are about eight feet off of that right of way. Um, the pavement is also wider, wider as it goes to Whitland. The home, of the kind of used to be single family, now multifamily, now Airbnb party house across the street from this one, across on Leonard. That I think has a 21 foot roughly setback. Creating this one to have a five foot setback, that's what makes it egregious. Where yes, there are bigger buildings that are taller on West End than the homes on Whitland. But when you are looking down the street, it's those setbacks from the street. This will be coming so much closer than right. anything else in the neighborhood. Well, what, what if they were not beaten? They were in line with, with all the other with the other two homes that were on Leonard. I think that'd be a different conversation um, that we'd be having, and that I need to have with the neighbors. And then I don't think that I'm prepared to represent them here today because it's not something that has been offered. And so, the, one of the options on the menu would be if y'all gave us the instruction to go back and and have another community meeting and and enter into negotiations. Quite frankly, if you want to know completely honestly, we've had a couple of developers. I already had my folder uh, full of the, the other plans from other developers. And at the end of the day, I, I almost feel like this is a property that should go through the SP zoning process. Um, so, so that, because that this is a unique property um, given the site restrictions of the scenic highway and things like that, but that doesn't negate that they, or, or that doesn't lead to their entitlement of the relief sought here today. Any other questions for Council Lady Murphy? Did you have anything else to add at this point? I have counsel tonight, so you probably should save my words. No. <laughs> All right, so um, Mr. White, I'm uh, oh, sorry. I don't want to be as old as he is. Don't do that to me now. Ms. Wallace, you asked about bringing Mr. White back to ask to answer some of the concerns or questions that Council Lady Murphy had. Is does anyone on the board object to giving Mr. White the opportunity to take two minutes to address and then answer questions? Well, if he needs two minutes, I'm going to fuss at him a little bit. But yeah. Does anybody, come up and I just want the one question okay, then, addressed then, if that was possible. Then. Now, Lord knows, I don't think I can restate it. I sure hope, Tom, that you listen to what I asked. But, okay, get us into the health and safety because I, I read your memorandum, I've read the, I've listened to everybody, and it's a shall. And I'm a, you know, and, but you do have health and safety and air and light and all the other things. I think you'll take care of the trees. So how do I get around that in adverse impact? The language is health, safety, and welfare, and it concentrates on impairing the long-term use. Nobody can credibly argue it's impairing the use of anybody in that area. And basically, it improves the intersection of West End and Leonard uh, by the traffic proposal that we've done. It takes that traffic chute away uh, secondly, with respect to the height, again, we're stuck with the scenic highway. We understand that, and I, whatever my language is, we understand that, whatever it is, we comply. We don't have any choice. We're not going to argue about that. The only issue before this board today is, are we entitled to the special exception? That's the issue. It's not design. Uh, it's not the elevations. It's nothing but that period. And the language is very clearly, shall be granted if you do it. Not one person has come here before you and said, oh, they don't need one of those two, the eight foot or the, or the 20. Nobody said anything, but they can't. It's obvious we qualify for it. So the then issue is how much, as was asked by Mr. Pepper earlier, and the staff of the planning department in a three-page report talked about the T4RC policy gives additional guidance for building form, site design, 
specific language on orientation and setbacks. They go through the guidance on setbacks. Buildings frame the corridor. And they conclude the proposed setback of five feet along Leonard is in line with the setback intent of the policy to provide shallow setbacks. That's what they're looking for, shallow setbacks. And still allowing a distinction between the private realm of the residence and the public realm of the street. Now, that's, that's the language of the staff. And with respect to the belief that's being granted, <clears throat> if it's granted, it's five feet. We can't change that. We've got to build in accordance with what we're asking for. But there's no dispute that we meet the qualifications. Nobody said that. No one disagreed. So the issue is, is it appropriate? And the other side would need to come forward and say that it's an impairment on the use. So we're improving the traffic configuration. We're amenable about the sidewalk, whatever relief that is. Uh, and basically, there's a realm of houses up and down of West End that are of the same height. When Fred Weber built Wilthaw, White Hall a long time ago, it the 35, 40 years ago, I don't remember how long ago it was, but it was clearly the exact same uh, design uh, and exact same impact on part of the properties behind it. It's no different. So nobody, I think, incredibly argued with tax the use. And as far as they confirm it, you know, frankly, this needs to be approved. I respect the ask to be approved today. And when we were contacted the day or two before the last neighborhood meeting and board meeting, I agreed to defer it so we could have another dialogue with neighbors to the WebEx meeting that Council Lady Murphy talked about, uh, and we set that up to run the council office. I appreciate her courtesies and flexibility. We've met repeatedly about this. Respectfully, shall be granted means what it says, and respectfully ask that that be done today. Thank you for your courtesy. I'll answer any questions. But any other questions for Ms. White? Okay. Thank you. All right. I think that uh, close public hearing. <laughs> Um, I, I, one of the, the things that I thought was that I think that clarifies that I mean the 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 light that I don't think that's an issue because it's on the south side of this new property. So any light is becoming it, like it's not going to block any light per se. You know, maybe a couple of days a year might. Like, but like, there's no significant impact on the light I don't see from this building, uh, just because of the orientation of it uh, being the north of these other properties. The only thing to the north of it is West End, and there's enough space there. Um, and I, I do understand some of the things about uh, a 35 foot building, but I mean, along West End, there are there are houses that you know, single family houses that get close to 35 feet. I mean, that's. I, you know, I, I don't think that's out of the character for that neighborhood, and you know, I, I think you're kind of getting to like, is nine feet more appropriate, or something like that. But I, I think, uh, you know, I, it could be, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be, I'd be amenable to that. But um, I think that there, I'm having a hard time getting to reasons that this shall that, 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 that we can't say that this meets the, the requirements that magic that, for, that magic word shall yeah right yeah, exactly yeah. I'm, I'm having a, it's kind of the opposite of a typical very yeah. request where you have to prove the hardship it's you have to prove that it doesn't meet it and, and I well, I'm having it. a hard time seeing that and it's, you know as in, in in terms of having a specific plan I mean as an architect you know or as a, I'm sure chip is a civil engineer I mean, you got to kind of know what you're working with to be able to really develop that, and that's not really what's before us today. What's before us is the setback that is part of the special exception. So um, I don't see this as the final time this one comes around to us. I mean, with all due respect to my fellow members, I think we'll see it again. Not necessarily for the, the what they're talking about here, but some other aspect of it at some point in time. Yeah. I, you know, the special exceptions are, are different and, and a little strange because I, I've been on this for a long time and I've never had a special exception where in the back of my mind I didn't think, well, where's the hardship? And I have to remind myself, well, no, this is a hardship. On this variance request, it's not about a hardship. It's about meeting the conditions. And I'm always grateful that there's a condition about impact because there are times when uh, there is an obvious negative impact that is taken into, into account. And here it's, it's, you know, I understand it and I can relate to it, and, and, and I'm still having a tough time with it. I mean, you know, 
I think it's, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm talking it through because we've sat here for a long time and I should have had a lot more time to think about it, but, you know, if it, if it were nine feet, uh, to me it's almost a no-brainer. You're lined up the other houses, you know, sorry. You're, it, you, you, you're not asking for anything that the neighbors don't have. Um, the, the, the four feet is, um, it is frankly what I'm, you know, trying to figure out. Although, on the four, on the on their request, favor, is it's 30 feet from the, the street, and this board is not always, but frequently viewed, uh, you know, the, the the distance from the street as a, um, you know, the essence of the setback. You know, it requires a 30 foot setback. And it's 30 feet from the street. Uh, in this in a certain situation, this board has said, "Well, it's, it's achieving the spirit of what the, the setback requires," which I think is what the planning says. So, I mean, that's the argument on one side, and then to me, from the neighbors, it's, "Well, it, it does stick out. It, it does come closer to the street than, than the uh, the homes on that side of the street." I'm not frankly worried about the ones on the other side because it's not that's not the visual line. Uh, I, I know some you know, neighbors may be worried about that, think about that, but I, that's, I, I look at it more on the contextual side. I agree with you. It's, I'm worried about the contextual um, street setback, um, as we talk about a lot, and this building will not be in line with the other building. But also, along, along those lines, the corner lot, it usually sticks out more yeah. than the rest of the street. I mean, that's pretty typical for a corner lot. You know, it's usually half the set, or whatever. You know, there's, there's rules in there. I, that's a completely different realm, but, you know, it, you know, I, I, in some ways you see it almost being a benefit to block some of the noise and, of the cars going out west end. So, I mean, I, you can argue it both ways, you know, I, I, I don't know, you know, and obviously the, the, the neighbors have stated their preference, you know, and, and they don't, they're not crazy about it. But well, we do have, I mean, we did have a lot of neighbors supporting. I mean, we had a lot of neighbors come in as an opposition, but we have a, you know, people that live on all the streets around it saying they support it too. So, I mean, it, it seems like it's even, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, I, I, was, I didn't want to interrupt you. Your eyes look like you wanted to say something. Well, I was just going to say that I, I think the argument cuts both ways. Like, I read it over and over again as everyone was giving their presentations, and it says an applicant shall provide evidence to the board as provided in section 17.12.060.F3 that the proposed building setback shall not create an adverse impact on adjacent properties, nor detract from a strong pedestrian friendly environment. And I think because it is on the corner, I think that the neighbors, in my opinion, have made, the, for, for me anyway, they've made a really good argument on how it does detract from some of the adjacent properties. And we typically do like contextual setbacks. We don't like people being blocked in because it is on a corner. That's even another reason, I think, to think about it. I do agree that because their wider way is larger and because planning did agree with it, I would be more inclined to support 9 feet because I think a setback is warranted here. But I think in light of all the testimony and the letters about how people say that this will negatively impact them, I think that they made a case for it. So that was just my thought. Uh, there was one comment that the council lady said that hit strongly with me, and it wasn't the environment, and it wasn't some of the other things, but Metro can always decide that it wants to widen this. I happen to live on Franklin Pike, which at one point in time, and maybe not too many people in here remember when it was two lane. Uh, it's four lane now, it's sort of like an interstate. But if, envision if you will, if this was four lanes, what that would do. And, and that is an, an, an impact that I'm sitting here thinking about, notwithstanding the others. I'm, I'm also having a hard time with the environment, and it's not in, uh, impacting it in a, in a negative way, which, but I've got the word shout. So, so I'm, this is not one of the easy ones. I don't know if I'm getting yeah. paid enough money for this, guys. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I want to raise. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the, the, yeah, I, I think you know, that, that, that winding the road has always been you know, out there for anybody, but at the same time, you know, I mean, honestly, where would winter go? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not, you know, to go down to, you know, people want to more cars and drive faster down to the creek, 
you know, the, uh, you know where stranger the, things happen. <laughs> it's just like, you know, yeah. it, 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 it hasn't happened in at least, you know, it, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that's, well, that, but that, that, I, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I, I think it's, it, there's still 30, it's still got 20, you know, you, you can, you can add another lane both sides and still have enough, you know, feet. I mean, the average life expectancy of a building is something like 40 years. So, you know, you know, I, it, it could, this building could be long gone in 40 years. That you know, you know. Well, but the other side too. Yeah, I think there's all these. Things, yeah. Yeah. The you statutory know. scheme right. that the, that the council was talking about, their dad, and Doug Henry, put in yeah. place is, yeah. you know, that goes back to the 70s. And, yeah. and yeah. so, to to me, um, and I'm not um, Murphy is takes. You take better care of your constituents than anybody I know. You, you laid out a, a bunch of great reasons that you're always so hard working and so conscientious. And, and I get all those things matter. I mean, neighbors want to preserve what they have and how their neighborhood looks. And, but and this is a special exception, and there is the word shall. And this adverse impact clause. What it boils down to is it says an adverse impact that will impair the reasonable long-term use of, the, of those properties. So when I read that, I view my job as really it, it becomes a lot easier because I don't have to consider the light and the air and those kind of things. I've got to consider is there a way this property, is there a neighboring property that can't be used? And I think those words were put in there for a reason. Um, I don't, you know, again, I think that they're, I understand the neighbor's position, and, but I, I'm also, I, I don't know that I would ever feel equipped to deal with all the, you know, the different opinions about how it affects or doesn't affect the neighborhood. Uh, I mean, and, and their opinions go on both ways. There's some neighbors that say they think this will be a, you know, a, a, a good addition to the neighborhood. Others think that they're going to be issues with it, but to me it boils down to I, I feel like I have to approve this because they've met the requirements. There's been, nobody has said they have not met the requirements. But then, it, then the question is, if they've met the requirements, is there an adverse impact on the neighborhood? And that's defined as very specifically, does it impair the reasonable long-term use of those properties? To me, that's a lot different than saying. In considering adverse impact, you have to consider light issues, uh, other aesthetic issues, or even or even property values. Uh, and that's why I was asking Mr. Michael earlier about was he aware? To me, to me, those you know, if it does affect property values, I'm not I'm not convinced it does, but you know, I'm not an appraiser. But uh, property value effect to me is different from impairing the reasonable long-term use of the property. So, um, you know, I appreciate the neighbor's position and, and, and all of their concerns, and, but I think I, really these special exceptions, of, of the thought I have with them when they come up is, these are a lot easier for me to deal with the variances because I, I feel like my discretion is so much more limited as to what we can do. So, but that's how I, I view it. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I, I, I have a hard time. I think you know the the property behind could still be used as single family dwelling, and not only the use of that as a single family dwelling would be impaired. But that's that's an interesting point. Uh, I'm kind of running through some of the things that I Basically, the signal to everybody that they have a right to develop this, that they have a right to at least a contextual overlay. And frankly, if they came back to us with a plan uh, that met some of the other conditions that the council lady and others have mentioned in terms of the height, the uh, you know, exactly tell us exactly what it's going to look like uh, with, with accuracy, 
if they came back with a request at five foot, then I think that's something to consider. But at least they would have uh, they would have a special exception that allowed them to build in line with the other homes on that street on the same block, uh, which would to me satisfy the, the contextual part. And so to me, those are those are the two options. And I think it's, it don't make did you did was yours a motion for nine foot? Because boy, I sure would go for that one if well, it was made it's, as a motion. And is again open for if there are other discussion, but that, that's kind of what I'm thinking is and 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 knowing that by saying that they can take it and develop it with that uh, contextual piece, or they can come back with about the uh, the same type of request with more information. Again, a, a brand new request with neighborhood meetings and, and that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to make a motion that we approve the special session at nine foot. Okay. Have a motion and have a second. Is there any other discussion? All in favor? Sorry, well, we can, we can, okay. yeah, I want to, so, so they're asking for five foot of the motion is to make you know, nine. The nine. Do it to the nine. Do it to the nine feet, right? Yeah. Right. Yes. So here's, fine, here's what. So what? Um, do we have authority to do that? Yeah. The way I view it is, okay. Add a little shot, Michael. Can you do that? We do. Yeah. You're sure? I'll look over that one. Do we have that authority? I agree that you do. Thank you. <laughs> well, and, and, and actually, you know, on, um, let me, uh, let me, uh, let me uh, ask for, when I, I went back to look at their, uh, the survey that they provided, and the two homes, one is eight foot one inch, one is uh, eight feet, so actually this is, uh, nine foot would set back a foot further, so Except that, you know, I was wanted in, in line with the two, so it, eight would be the right number. If, I'll, if I'll amend my motions. But again, just to be in line with those two homes, is that acceptable for a second? Actually, I think Christina is. Yeah, Christina was. I'm sorry, I thought you were going to do it. So the motion is approve it for eight feet. Yes. Approve it for eight feet. We would put it in line with the other homes. And then we'll go on that constant. Con Straight up and down. And if like they, and if that's, again, it, it goes to your point. It lets them decide can they live with it. If they can't, then they go back to the neighborhood, bring us another proposal. If they can, then they have to uh, meet all the other requirements of the highway, sidewalk, all that stuff. So we have a motion, have a second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. Opposed? All right, that motion passes by the one. All right, we'll take a little break. Yes. Yeah. And then we'll get the next one. God, I feel like I'm so We're requesting duplex eligibility on an undersized lot located at 67 Cannon. It's within the R6A zoning district. This is a parcel view provided by the appellant. Street view. Additional street view. This 
case was was previously deferred from from the last meeting to allow for the council member to I think obtain additional information. I do not have any uh, yes. I'm sorry, we have received correspondence There's from the council member. We do. I, think, I think everyone has that, um, and we can read that into the record after we hear from the applicant. So, applicant, if you'd like to state your name and address. And I'm Clamber Road, resident of 14 North Hill Street, owner of 70, sorry, have 67 Counter Street, Nashville. Uh, I come before you today to request a variance of the minimum lot size requirement to permit two single family homes to be built on my lot. My lot, zoned R6A, is 5,485 to 0.75 square feet, which is 8.57% short of the 6,000 square foot size required to build two homes on it. My lot suffers the hardship of having an unusually narrow frontage and width of 33 square feet, which is narrower than most R6A lots in the area. Yet my lot is certainly long enough to fit two homes on it. My parcel has the misfortune of having been created in 1925 to reflect the development patterns of the time before zoning and density was even thought of in Nashville. I propose to build two two-story homes to be built facing Cannon Street. All parking, building coverage and setbacks will meet code requirements. The outcome I'm requesting is not abnormal for this particular area. In fact, most of the <coughs> block immediately north of me is composed of single-family lots under 2,500 square feet and there are many more lots in the area which are less than half of the size of mine. So the two homes on my lot would have more land per dwelling than many of the homes surrounding it. My lot is in a neighbourhood with a significant number of two single family developments on R6A lots perceptively similar to mine, two of which are on undersized lots within two blocks of mine. This busy age is late last year, permitted two HDRs to be built very close to here on Wharf Avenue on lots just 4,500 square feet each. Four new HBR homes are currently being built three doors down from me at 59 and 61 Cannon Street. Besides the new HBRs on my street, the nicest closest homes to me are the HBRs on the undersized lot 13 doors down from me at 72A and 72B Murray Street on a 5,606 square foot lot slightly larger than mine. This variance was awarded by this today in 2017. There is a 3,954 square foot lot with two homes on it, just eight doors down from mine at 79 Fairfield Avenue, which is only 72% of the size of my lot. I have received an outstanding 57 letters of support from neighbours, representing 86 properties in the Navy neighbourhood, and have to date received no, no opposition at all to my request. Uh, my 8.5% variance should also be taken into the consideration of the neighbourhood it is in, which is run down and very much in need of reinvestment. The streets surrounding the property have many unoccupied homes, which are in very bad condition, and this HBR will greatly help to improve the look, feel, functionality, and safety of the neighborhood. I hope from the bottom of my heart that you will help me to make something good finally come with my last 10 years of great stress, expense, blood, sweat, and tears on my property. Um, there is a great shortage of affordable housing in the area, and it's my sincere intent to provide quality, new, and affordable housing to the community. Uh, I would like to ask Dwayne Cutherson to speak uh, for the rest of my time. Thank you on, on my behalf. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dwayne Cutherson, 409 Merritt Avenue. Um, I, I was asked, I work for a handful of clients who own property or interest in this neighborhood, so I was asked to look at the request. Uh, I was also approached by uh, Claire, and she asked me to look at it. Uh, so I did, and um, I have to say that I'm pretty comfortable supporting the request. The, the, to me, the, the context of this neighborhood is, is her unique circumstance. This, lot, this neighborhood is all over the map. There are lot sizes of varying sizes uh, all over, and then the housing type. There's, there's a lot of density, sporadic density in this neighborhood, multifamily housing. Um, but you'll also find that there are a lot of R6A lots that are half the size of hers. And so the density that she's asking you for is pretty consistent with what's there already. The request that she's asking for is, is pretty small. Uh, and again, I think the outcome she's asking for fits into the context. Uh, this is a neighborhood that needs reinvestment. And um, I'm asking you to support it. She's gotten a lot of support from this neighborhood. Uh, so I feel, again, comfortable standing before you. Any, any questions? Thank you. you want? Yes, sir. Hello, yes, I'm Warren Sawyers. I'm, uh, I own the uh, property directly behind Claire's. Uh, we're looking forward to her investing in, in, investing in the community. 
There's a lot of challenges there, and I think by putting new properties in, it will be helpful. She also has uh, some other people out in the hall that are here to, say, uh, to support us as well. So we really appreciate your consideration and to improve this community. We've got one minute remaining. I have a lender at reasonably priced builder ready to help me to uh, complete this development. I have through no fault of my own had 10 years of extremely bad luck with my property. Since buying my property in 2010, I've not made a dollar from it, yet spent over 40000 on property related expenses and attempts to improve the existing home in my lot, other than have it now completely gutted to the studs and beyond repair. The majority of the damage and expense was caused by vandal squatters, thieves, and unethical contractors. I just appreciate uh, very much your time today. I know it's been a long one. I really, you will make me the happiest person probably this side of the Mississippi if, if you would approve this. And I really do believe it's going to be better than it would. That's, that's what I'm truly intending to do and provide affordable housing for those who need it. All right. Time is up. Is there any, any questions? Great. We'll close the public hearing. The, we do have uh, a letter from Freddie, I think everybody has, that um, you know, said that he wanted to get us some analysis. He asked Metro Planning to give him some information. He said that there are 321 R6A properties, 123 or under 6,000 uh, square feet. Uh, it's clear that the majority of the R6A lots in Napier would not support an HPR without a variance, so there's no parcel that can claim a unique hardship. Um, but it, he also provided two, um, two photos, one that has all the lots in that uh, area, and then um, one that just has the lots that are under 6,000 square feet. And it, to me, it's a kind of a 50-50. There, there's no, to me, there's no clear pattern. You know, I mean, there's just, there's a lot that are and a lot that aren't. And on this, on this case, we've got, uh, a property owner that's 8% uh, off the required uh, lot size to be brought um, more support for the lot size variance from the people in the neighborhood than any I think I've ever seen at the BC hearing, which is unusual. If there's a unique situation, it might be that. Uh, that whereas most lot size variances come with a lot of opposition, hers has come with a lot of neighborhood support, including your uh, backyard neighbor that came today. So I think that's kind of where we are. And what are your thoughts on the variance request? Yeah, I, I think of you know in any of these cases, I think of you know who does this hurt, and, and if, it, if, any, if it hurts anyone, it's going to hurt her immediate neighbors, and she obviously has a lot of support, and even something showed up today for that. Um, I know we typically look at the percentage off of you know, and I know that's you know, but it, it seems it's so close to that six thousand square feet. I think I would be fine. Tom, uh, Tom looked at me. I think that he's giving me the nod to go before him. Is that true? Please. <laughs> Thank you. Ladies <laughs> always first. <laughs> um, so I, know, I already know where Ross is, which I love. I love that I know you at this point now. And I think he knows where I am, right? I think he knows where I am, which I also appreciate. Um, I didn't hear a hardship. I didn't even like. I didn't even hear close to a hardship. And like that's what the law says. And. I'm really appreciative of Freddie's analysis because to me his analysis was pretty even killed. It didn't say one way or the other, it just gives us the information and says that it prompts some forward looking consideration, which I agree with. And he says that based off this information, no one can claim a unique hardship. So while I, I think it's amazing that there's so much support and I think it's great that her neighbor showed up, I don't like without a hardship, it's sort of hard for me to vote in favor of it. So that's just where I am. <coughs> Go ahead and well, use your eight kind of percent. You guys all know my kind of temperature. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I consider that a uh, that really truly is a part of the community having done some real estate litigation and 
run into surveying, especially in Nashville, where a lot of our lots are blocks are laid out and we're measured back whenever. Um, I just think it's possible. It's always very likely. It's one. It's already really close, and then there's a possibility that it's based on some deviation that's probably within some degree of the of, of a survey that I just kind of consider that a fall, as falling under the, you know, other extraordinary circumstance. Um, that's how I come to the hardship part of it. And um, so, you know, and I think that's just kind of the rule I follow. I, I do think if there are neighbors that strongly object or there's some reason, you know, that should be considered, but I, I don't see that here. Let me at least, Chase, just say this is, is, I mean, what my heart wants to do and what I legally can do are two separate and distinct things this time. So I'm, I'm justifying, I guess, not being able to do what I want to do because I have to agree with Judge. Her, her analysis of it is correct. I didn't hear a hardship other than I've had a lot of money coming out of my pocket. And I desperately want to go with your less than 10% rule, but I'm, I guess I'm explaining why I'm going to have to go with you this time. So let someone else make the motion, or I'll make a motion that, that we deny it and have it lose. And then, Ross, why don't you do your, you normally do? I'm too, I'm too risk averse. I'm going to let you do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be glad to do it. I, I, I move that we. Approve the, the application and approve the variance. Is there a second? With, oh. with the hardship being? The hardship being the other extraordinary circumstances. If it's within, this was 8%, and I uh, also do think that, as pointed out by the council, the councilman, that, I mean, he says no one can, 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 can claim a unique hardship. And I get that, but you know, that doesn't rule out that there are people that, that the lot size does create hardships for people in the neighborhood. So um, those are my bases. I'll second that. I have a motion. I have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, raise your hand and say aye. For those opposed, that motion passes four to two. Thank you very much. It was one of my hearts. Thank you. All right, good luck. with our overhead view, so I will point it this way so you can sure. see what slide we're talking about. The board the board members can see this. Um, the parcel aerial view of the, of the property. There's the overhead view. 
There's your proposed footprint. As part of your explanation, I'd like you to describe your footprint and, and sure. the intent of your, your proposed construction on the site. Street views and alternate street views. So if you'll introduce yourself by name, address, and then state your, your case. Sure. Thank you. Um, I'm Ryan Siebels. I live at 4011 Overbrook Drive uh, in Nashville. Um, and I'm a partner in, with Elmington Capital Group. We're a, a local real estate investment company. Uh, we bought this property in 2016, so we've owned it for about four years. Um, we are a big landowner, our property owner in this area. Uh, we own two buildings directly across the street from the subject property. There's two white buildings. Um, further close up the street, there is another building with the Pete Dennis in it that we bought. We own property even closer to Hillsborough Village at the corner of Portland Avenue and 21st. And then we recently finished construction of our Belfort Village development, which is across the street from the Belfort Theater. Um, so we've got a large vested interest in this part of town, a good relationship with uh, the former council lady, now at large council lady, Berkeley Allen, um, and also a councilman, Tom Cash. So um, anyway, our, our proposal is to um, take down the current building and replace it with a new 17,000 square foot in total uh, across two floors building that's specifically for a company called Blue Pearl Veterinary. Uh, Blue Pearl is backed by the Mars Pet Care family, a very reputable group with about 70 locations around the country, uh, including some in the Middle Tennessee area, uh, one being on 12th South, uh, Avenue, 12th Avenue South. Um, they also have one in Franklin, Murfreesboro, and I believe one in Goodlettsville. Um, Councilman Cash uh, has checked with Councilman uh, Colby Sledge regarding their use on 12th Avenue, which would be replaced. They would relocate that into our new facility, but Councilman Sledge was very complimentary of them as a, as a uh, business within their district. So I'm going to turn it over to Sam Samantha O'Leary. She'll explain a little bit more of the footprint and a little bit more of the building. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Uh, I'm Samantha O'Leary. I'm a partner with Southeast Venture Design. Uh, we are at 4030 Armory Oaks Drive. Uh, just to expand on the actual uh, variance we're requesting, we apologize for any miscommunication or, or interpretation. Um, we were assuming that the 2500 was limited to the ground floor building footprint, so our initial application says 7,000 square feet. Um, but as you and I discussed before, if it's just the overall footprint, including the overhang of the second floor, it would be 11,000. As Brian said, the total gross square footage we're looking at right now is 17,000. Um, so I just want to clarify exactly, if it's just simply the footprint, then the 11,000 is what we uh, adjust that to. So we apologize for that miscommunication. Um, but yeah, we're, we're uh, asking for a variance on that uh, code section 17.16.060B um, for the veterinarian use that limits it to the 2,500. Um, I don't think I have any further to add. Yeah, I, I, yes. have a, I think it's for, uh, for codes, not for you all. Sure. But the, the 2,500 square foot footprint relates to the fact that it's a veterinary use, not that, I mean, if it was an office building, we wouldn't be here, right? Correct. In fact, they probably could even build bigger than what they're doing, but because it's it's a veterinary use, they have to, to come here. Because it, when I'm when I saw it, I thought, you know, why are we here for 2,500 square feet on this quarter of 21st, you know, but it's because of the use. That um, is correct. So, and then, it, and the, the entire facility is going to be used for animal hospital bed? The veteran in Blue Pearl. Okay. And also, to just add to that real quick, the FAR... Is it just two stories? Correct. Okay. Um, and zoning um, allows two stories within 30 feet, we're, and it has a control plan, but we're sticking to two stories only. Um, the FAR allows 26,000 square feet to be, be developed. We're well short of that, so we're, we're less than the allowable square footage. We're just asking for a little more than what the code says for veterinarians. So, okay, so um, I'm, 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 I didn't know that. That's, good. That's really good information to have, that it could be an office building. I'm guessing uh, that maybe the reason is because there, it, it's perceived maybe there's less coming and going in an office build, building and something that's more, that's more retail, I guess. What is the anticipation in terms of how would you compare to an office building 
terms of people coming and going during the day and and, uh, and parking and all that kind of stuff. I'm just guessing, but I'm, I'm, there's got to be a reason they distinguish office buildings from uh, sure, other, and I, other uh, establishments. Sure. Um, we, we've had discussions with Blue Pearl, and I don't recall off the top of my head, Ryan, if you want to step in and uh, speak on that. Um, but it, it's something we've also tried to get clarification on why the limit was 2,500 for veterinary use. I truthfully am not aware of why that is the number. Um, but to function properly, Blue Pearl and, and us on behalf of Elmington are just requesting the larger footprint. But as far as traffic, foot traffic, um, Blue Pearl, I, it doesn't seem to be much different than the office. And yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're planning 52 parking spaces for the the property, which we is, is you know satisfactory of what's the requirement, it's, it's fine for Blue Pearl. I think maybe it is. It will be have some 24 hour, um, very limited at night, but they do see some emergency um, uh, cases. So um, I don't I think that's they, I think there was a concern by neighbors about that too. That there would be uh, more coming and going. I didn't, I didn't realize it. So it'll, it'll operate as a 24 hour emergency facility essentially. Yes, sir. But it'll replace the one on 12, is it? Correct. Okay. Uh, and we have had a couple of uh, neighborhood meetings, and, um, you know, obviously I have a lot of questions from different people within that neighborhood, uh, but we do have, as a result of that, the support of Councilman Cash and from the So, um, yeah. Yeah, there, a, we have a letter from uh, Councilman <coughs> Cash here. I, I, I didn't know that we'd gotten, I don't see anything specific from Hillsborough West End, but if, you, if you've gotten their support met with them, we certainly don't have anything for opposition uh, from that neighborhood. So, so that I understand, you're going to have the 24, avail 24 hour a day availability for emergency purposes. You're not going to be storing or letting any dogs other than the ones that come in in the middle of the night and get operated on or whatever happens. Yeah, they've been very clear that it is not a boarding. Like, this is simply for emergency pet care. They don't have a dog run or outdoor area for dogs to be contained. I mean, it's you're out and you're, you're being seen. Well, we're saying dogs. I'm sure that sure, yes. these dogs or cats, or right. you're not going to be bringing a bunch of bovines or anything like that in. <laughs> okay. Household pets. Yeah, household pets. The parakeet gets to come in and help you. Know. Okay. We were not able to see the presentation, so can you tell us a little of uh, the, the existing photos of what's on the site? So can you tell us a little bit about the building that's there now that's being taken down? Maybe? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so the property is, is three quarters of an acre, and it's at the corner of 21st and Westwood Avenue. Um, the building that is there is 11,660 square feet. Um, it was built in 1974, um, and it's two stories uh, with service parking around it. So what we would be doing is, is basically adding roughly 5,000 500 square feet to what is currently there. About the same number of parking spaces? Or? Yeah, so right now we're, we are over parked. I mean, I think we will be very similar. I, 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 offhand, I don't know the exact number of parking spaces that we have today, but I think we're in the neighborhood of like 54, 55, and we'll have 52. So is it fair to say that what, what I'm hearing is boiling it down, the hardship is or veterinary, it's a, it's, it's a not zone for a veterinary clinic. I mean, that's the hardship, I think. Basically, that's what it boils down to. I'm not sure that's yeah. a hardship, but I, no, I'm just I trying to... No, I would add that the 2500 is very restrictive to the use and this business functioning, uh, properly functioning. So we just seen that that square footage that it was limited to doesn't seem achievable for their business. 
there was a there was a, when we were reviewing the cases um, for possible consent items. I, I know that I was talking with Lisa and John about you know veterinary clinic versus veterinary hospital, and it it, it seems like there's it, it's like how you classify something, and it's not it probably wasn't arbitrary when it was developed, but it also may have had a more agricultural focus to say if. You're in, in the city and you're smaller because we really don't want you to bring horses and cows and therefore you have to be smaller and it just really hasn't changed and there hasn't really been a, a, a proposal like this to come into the city to say yeah we need to be a little bit bigger to do some of the things we're doing and we're not we're not totally this hospital but we're not totally just a vet's office and yet so i, I think is, is that Great. summarizing our conversation yes Appropriately. So, do we? What? What is it? Is it just one? Is it just a veterinary clinics? Or you know, what, I guess my question is: Is there is there any possibility that they could be considered office? The medical office. Kind of you know, the, we we've got. Yeah, I know we've got, got a pen in the right land use under the land use table, uh, so he gets them there under the zoning code, and, but just with this restriction of the twenty five hundred square feet. The, as the chairman alluded to, we think that's possibly a bit of an antiquated restriction, not just any restriction being antiquated there, but that particular one. I know one other where groceries in certain zoning districts travel with a square footage limitation. So what is it, it, the veterinary clinic has a square footage limitation that the office doesn't? Uh, I, I don't recall if the office does or not, but not all uh, uses would to your platform. This particular not, not, all not all uses would have a square footage limitation. This, if, for example, this is on a massive lot, that this particular use would come in <coughs> still needing to restrict their size to 2,500 square feet, or what the FAR, I guess, is the language that the 2,500 number applies. Even if the building was 30 stories, they would still come in with that use being defined in that, or restricted in that way. It just so happens here that you have a nice size lot that's not massive, the building that's not massive, but yet big enough to do this, if the board grants this relief. Um, again, I don't have enough background on the legislative history of how that number was arrived at and implemented into the zoning code. I suspect strongly it's been in place long before this 1998 iteration. In fact, 1974, what older lawyers call Cosmo, the um, prior iteration of the zoning code, I think included it as well. So it's veterinary clinics and it's 2,500 feet as well. We differentiate the hospital versus the uh, veterinary office, but right. conceptually they become one and the same through the years. And this is something we deal with a lot with our land use table, where uses, not always defined under the land use table, can be hard to figure out where they fit. But then even when you have defined uses, maybe a use merges over time. I mean, maybe it's my country roots, but there was the vet office where you took your cats and your dogs, and then there was maybe uh, Dr. Carroll who handled cattle for the farmers and the horses and the mules and things like that. But I don't guess we have as much mule practice here in Davidson County, uh, unlike right. the Dixon County of my youth. That said, there are different uses traditionally, and I've always kind of thought this particular provision of the zoning code made sense because maybe we don't necessarily want a massive animal hospital where Farmer Tom brings his 40 head of cattle to be operated on in the middle of Hillsborough Village. Instead, perhaps that's better relegated to agricultural zone districts or industrial zone districts or the rare SP dedicated to bovine surgery, I suppose. But, but you as a zone administrator feel constrained that you have to classify this as a veterinary office. It's a matter of the best interpretation. Again, the land use table talks about, uh, the there's a slight difference, I believe, and you may have it in front of you, Ms. Ms. Minton, but the um, veterinary office versus animal hospital. Right. But veterinary office still just gets you 2,500 feet. Within, yes. yeah, within the OR20, the zoning district, which is this property. So, but you're not comfortable. You, you, you feel like you can't classify this as a regular office because you have this definition in there of veterinary office. It, 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 we've got it in the right land use. This is kind of the best way forward. Uh, absent a change to the zone code. Happy to answer any questions, but I hope that will be helpful. Oh, that was very well, Thank you very much. Any other questions for the applicant? Did you have anything else to add? Uh, no, I think that was everything. Awesome. Thank you. We'll close the public hearing. Thoughts? Well, so, uh, 
the footprint is limited to 2,500 square feet, and the applicant stated um, the allowable FAR is 26,000. So you could technically build a 10-story building yeah, right. with that footprint, and they're not seeking to do that. They're seeking well, a lot of stuff. Yeah, and I, I'm just looking in the in the land use. It, I mean, it, it does have provisions for like a boarding camp or something like that within this same veterinary use. So, that, you know, maybe that's the condition is not used as a kennel as, as part of, you know, what it is that, you know, we allow the more square footage with this condition that, you know, that they're not using it as a boarding kennel. Right. Because that's, that's in the, you know, that's in the code of the bill. Well, not the uh, <laughs> Come on, Jim. Here. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I'm struggling with. Here. And as a matter of full disclosure, I have two pets, and I, 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 go, I, it would be, I live in that neighborhood, so I think it would be a fantastic addition. I'd be all for it. I guess what I'm struggling with is that I, I feel like in ways I'm being, the hardship here really is that, that the way the zoning code exists, they have to be classified in a certain way, and that what I'm really doing is saying is that I'm overriding the zoning code and saying it's antiquated, and obviously it is because it doesn't seem to me, or maybe it is, maybe there's some still justification. I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little concerned that there is at least one neighbor who who feels like, you know, what's gonna, this is gonna be different from a regular office because we have more people coming and going, and maybe that's why they classify it. So I, I, I would. I think this is a great use. I'd like to find a way to uh, get there and improve it. And um, but you know, so, so somebody tell me what the hardship is because I, I, I'm just seeing that it's a zoning. I feel like I'm being asked to legislate, and it's, I hate that that falls on a good use that maybe the zoning code should have taken care of before now. But it, it also I want to be very aware of what my I guess, I mean, it, on, on, on that same line though, if the zoning code perfectly regulated every use, then we wouldn't exist. We wouldn't be here as a, you know, a zoning appeals. And, you know, and, and we're here to, to, to see where the zoning code falls short or, or you know, and, you know in, in part. And so I guess, I guess this is a question for our legal counsel is, 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 is the, is the zoning code falling short an appropriate hardship that we could, you know? Um, it sounds like that. Uh, I would struggle to find a hardship out of something that the zoning code is antiquated. That seems more policy based. Okay. Something for Metro Council to change, and then you could hop in and do it from there. Yeah. But at this point, you you would you could find then a hardship in a lot of ways if, if, if the code is one that you can base a hardship off. Of. All right. Well, to me, that there's, you know, and I, I would support the variance because I do think that you know, you've got the, the toughest, um, and, and, and alleviate the concerns over uh, over uh, crossing into legislation because the you know the, the councilman who represents the district has written a letter uh, supporting this. The H uh, one is one of the oldest um, neighborhood associations in the. That area, and you know, it, it. They didn't write a letter of support, but we got testimony that they do support uh, through their community meeting, and I guarantee you that they would have been here in force if, if they didn't support. So I think it has broad neighborhood support, and to me, I, I read the letter of opposition, and it seemed it almost focuses more on, uh, you know, is it more traffic? Uh, is you know, 21st is busy, and you know, I'm. Not too far from there, I'd have to make left turns on 21st. I'd have to go to Blair to the light, or I have to go to another place where there's a light. And having an animal clinic here, or an office building, or anything there, is not going to change that traffic flow. So, um, you know, it, it, if I had to, you know, define the hardship, it, um, you know, I think that there's an element too of, 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 a, of you know, a building owner who wants to. You know, who, who's different from the tenant? And if the tenant lasts five years, and you know, then you know, if I'm right, they could have so much more than they have. And so, uh, 
to me, it's, it's just a clear mismatch and, and whatever um, other extenuating circumstances, I think, has, has been a, a criteria that we have fallen on a, on rare times for hardships. And to me, this clearly falls into all of those things aligning. Um, it's not just there's no harm. It is that there is gain and there's you know, no you know, evolution. Right. And support and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, would, I would support the variance. Uh, is that really the function if you have a black and white prohibition it's in the code that says and unfortunately I'm, I like what they want to do I just can't see us because we don't like it disregarding it and it almost gets to the level of arbitrary and capricious we're getting doggone close to it uh, right. and, I, and I'm I understand that maybe the best thing for them to do is to approach their members in the Metro Council. The good news is, is I might very well be outvoted because I can't support it. So I'll have a clear conscience. But I, uh, I don't see that that is our function in this particular instance because it's black and white. Well, this, yeah, sorry, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say that I was inclined to support the variance because I think there is a hardship in the sense that it falls into that category, that catch-all of like extraordinary circumstances because I don't think they're your typical clinic, I don't think they're your typical hospital, and they're not your typical kennel. And I liked um, Logan's suggestion of putting the restriction on making sure that there's no boarding because I think that, you know, I think I, I typically agree with Tom and I typically agree with Mr. Pepper, but I think that because of how things have evolved and how the zoning column has may not have kept up with it, I think given the zoning for this area and the type of building that it is, I think that this use works, and I think the applicant has demonstrated a hardship based off of the proposed use of the. Well, I also think like if there was an 11,000 square foot office building that was there, and we were evaluating it for a clinic to go into that existing building, I don't think we had any kind of discussion. You know, it's, it, it's it's, you know, I, I, I appreciate what you said about, you know, they can, you know, th this veterinary kind of may not last forever, and then you're stuck with this building that's in, you know, and it's, a, it's in the site that, that's way undersized, you know, and it's and 11,000 square feet seems more appropriate, you know, in terms of scale, in terms of, you know, the, the lot size, all that kind of stuff for this called corridor. And so I, 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 I do think that's it. Any other? Well, I, I think they'll have clothes. I can't. Again, I, just, I, I want the applicant to know I think it's a great use. <coughs> but I, I do, and I think our learning code needs some work in that area. Um, but I do see it coming to be and classified by the zoning administrator in a certain way. And so uh, I just want to make clear that I think it's a great project. I think it's a Y'all are stuck in a bad situation, but I don't think that I can vote for it. So. Well, I'll just, can I just add one clear, uh, just ask one particular question now to our favorite legal counsel. You knew I was going to come back to it. They could have a, uh, an outpatient people clinic in the same location, couldn't they? I mean, that, as for... All I can really address is what's proposed. I understand. I understand. I'm not so trying to. So, if they were traveling under a different use, then different uh, lot sizes would apply. So, yeah. but that's not. That's not what, that's not what they're here for, and I understand that. So, and that's why I'm going to have to go sure. the way I'm going to go. But I think it's a great use of the property. I just don't think that's the function of this particular uh, board to, to, in essence, legislate. So. Maybe, maybe the, the council will update some things that need to get updated. But, David, I'm going to duck into your hands. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion that we approve the variance based on the, the extraordinary circumstances presented uh, and note that there's a, a, a support of the neighborhood association and the council member of the district. And uh, 
uh, put the restriction that it uh, not be used as uh, a kennel for board animals that are not medically, uh, that it's not, or it's not medically necessary to be boarded. Um, knowing that if, you know, if you have a sick animal, that you keep that animal overnight if needed, but if not, if on a, we're going on a now, here's the dog uh, basis. Are you limiting it also to dogs and cats? Or are you going to? No, 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 no. Whatever else. <laughs> whatever, whatever, Home pets. Whatever they uh, are legally able to. Their comfort to law. Law. So that's the motion. Is a second. There's a second. There's a motion and a second. Any other discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion say aye and raise your hand. Any opposed? That motion passes 4 to 2. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. If I was an architect, the damn thing would fall down. I can guarantee you that. I'm just saying. Well, it's a. I just think the legislature needs to do the legislating. Do their. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I mean, but I like what they were doing. That was the problem. It's kind of a, it's like, I feel like, I feel like it happens common sense. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Common sense in the law doesn't I know, that, that, that's why I'm not a lawyer, because I get these common sense there. Yeah. <laughs>
we're trying to do a development that fits the context of this corridor, the only place where we can provide that aerial access is the inside of the property. Normal drive aisle is 20 to 24 feet wide. We've got to provide one that's 41 feet wide. And so for us to get just average, normal uh, residential dwellings on this property, we've got to separate them on the inside of this property by a considerable distance. Um, so our request is to push those southern buildings back just eight and a half feet into that rear setback. So the rear setback applies to all parcels, all zoning districts in Nashville for the most part. And that rear setback, it's pretty consistent 20 feet. It's there to create spacing like air along those back property lines uh, between opposing districts, between like, like districts. Uh, and so ultimately you end up with about 40 feet of separation between principal buildings. We've got a 25 foot wide alley back there on top of the rear setback. So as it stands right now, we've got 65 feet of separation. So we're asking for an eight and a half foot variance so we can do a, a development that we think fits the context of this neighborhood. And ultimately, we would still have a considerable amount of spacing between our principal buildings and the buildings to the south. Um, so for us, the unique part, the unique circumstance is this aerial access issue. It is the fact that we've got overhead lines on three, of, three out of our four frontages. Uh, and we're trying to do something that we think, think adds value to the neighborhood. We did speak with a council member. We have had a community meeting. We've received support. So far, we sent out 288 notices to surrounding property owners. Not one person has showed up. Nobody's written in to the board. So we feel like we've got a lot of support. Um, the only pushback we got from anybody in the neighborhood was, I wish you could do more here. Um, so uh, that's really the case. And so what, if I was the, um, I guess, you know, when I look at it, you think, well, is, is there a solution that you could achieve that without the variance and and so with the choice to make these things separate homes versus you know the town homes that you access and have that 41 feet through the alley you know why is that not okay, why, did, why is it important to have these separate homes instead of a different solution that might give you 20 units so and not no variance i'm sorry the decision to do detached homes came from the developer, uh, and it was, it was his attempt to kind of meet in the middle. It is on an intense corridor, but it does um, extend back into the neighborhood. We do have detached homes on the south side. We have detached homes to the, to the west. Right. Um, so for them to do detached homes, it was, it was kind of their way of, nobody asked them to do it, but they felt like it was their way of bridging that transition into the residential neighborhood, for them to get, for them to use aerial access, um, as I think you might have suggested, let's say they just blew out the alley and made it 41 feet wide, they have to combine the, all of the buildings. So then the fire marshal would only accept that if you did a singular building, so that the fire and rescue could get up there from one point. And I think you also, and the architects may correct me or clarify more, but you have to demonstrate that you have that they can get up there and there are no obstructions. They can effectively access the entire roof um, structure once they get up from that point. So with this, any sort of separation, they've got to have air even if we combine this into say four buildings, they would have to have aerial access within fifteen feet of each of those buildings. And so for putting it down the center is the most efficient way to get to every single building. I guess the, I guess the, well, that's fine. Could, could, could you not take the lines that are up and bury them? I'm asking now. I know that's expensive, okay. but I'm just asking. So, so the answer is always absolutely. Of course you can. And I, well, I'm, 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 I'm yeah. getting the chortle from my fellow over here. You're giving me a heart. I'm just asking. No, the answer is absolutely yes. You but can. it's expensive. It's very rare. Really. And, and oftentimes, it's not a matter of you can't, usually you can't just bury the lines in front of just your property. Because 
they will often look at it. You mean you don't want it to go down, yeah. under, and, and back up? You can, I think you can accomplish that. I've seen that, but very often I'm all, I've been told you're not just taking down the lines in front of your property. You've got to take it down to the end of the block or um, some other determined uh, length. I guess, look at this, I guess, I mean, I think a lot of times, you know, 
a lot of times this you know might be part of a you know a larger if it's a large part of a larger development it might be part of an SP and those lines might be buried as, as part of that process you know but um, I don't know I, I'm kind of I'm kind of the same mind I, I I can I can see I mean I appreciate the you know council member support neighborhood support you know is there a way to do it otherwise maybe um, but yeah it's, this is definitely kind of a a new one for me. I guess one question I would have, if these were just single family dwelling units, would the that setback from the alley, would that only, for like a garage or something like that, that would only be 10 feet, right? The garage element depends, of course, on whether it's constructed facing the alley or facing okay. the interior of the lot. Okay. So there's kind of more to it. Than okay, that. gotcha. Because I was just thinking, if, if these were, if we were almost treating these like a, you know, an outbuilding or something like that, um, in terms in regards to the alley, you know, because that's what the other lots around here are um, single family, you know, some single family and stuff. And if they're facing the alley and they have a garage that's detached back there, how close can it be to the alley? And, you know, it, it, would this be similar to that, I guess, is what I was trying to think. Yeah. So I'll ask architects, is it unique? It, 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 it seems to me it's a unique circumstance that you have side of your property with yeah with uh, with, with power, power on line. sure yeah, yeah that's true uh, that's true uh, that's ugly power lines <laughs> against me <laughs> yeah I think if it you could say the word special exception but if it was filed that way which it could have been I think because it's in the UCO then it would be <laughs> would be seeing the arguments as um the case earlier, whether or not it was um, detrimental to the, the neighboring property if the buildings were moved closer to the alley, but I don't think it is, but it's not filed that way, so I guess it's not really a great analysis. Yeah, in, in general, is there further other thoughts or concerns that it, I guess the hardship that was presented is the, the need for access and the, uh, the fact that, that it can't have that access with the power lines. Is there anybody that has trouble with that hardship or trouble with the request? Or is there someone else going to mention Barry or again? Or, or, or we're just saying no, it could be solved in a different way and they need to go back and, and think it through. Uh, so I guess, I guess either entertain a motion one way or the other. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, just, yeah, I'm, still, I'm, I'm still thinking through it. Well, yeah. I'm thinking through, but yeah, the talk, the talking through, or just any other thoughts to, to get to uh, an answer for, for folks. I mean, if you were the guy up on the second floor and you couldn't get out, you're going to get crispy critter, you'd be real upset. Chill. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a self-improvement? Okay. Why not? So I will move to approve the bearing request based on the uniqueness of the lot, which is having three street frontages and an alley, as well as the aerial act, the challenge with the aerial access requirement. And yeah, I, I, based on Ms. Carpenter's beautifully laid out motion, I will second that. All right, have a motion, have a second. Any discussion? All right, call the question. All in favor of the motion, raise your hand, say aye. Those opposed to the motion, raise your hand. That motion passes 5-1. All right, good luck. Yeah, I think it's a a variance from the 100 foot distance requirement for a driveway from the street intersection. The requesting is to use an existing 33 foot uh, curb cut driveway that is on the site. 
and it's for a proposed, um, I believe, multi-use property. That's correct. There's the aerial. Sorry. The no, it's fine. <laughs> There's the proposed site. I believe you're using the existing building also. That's correct. Yes. Existing street view of the property and up and down the street. There's no one in opposition to this case either, so if you'll just introduce yourself, your address, and state your case. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Trip Smith, 2606 Eugenia Avenue. Um, I'm a civil engineer on the project. Um, as Councilman Weathers uh, said earlier, uh, this is a, an adapted reuse project for the existing, or what was the Bill Lawrence grocery store. Um, the current right-of-way uh, southern property boundary of the property um, it, it really has uh, around six separate curb cuts um, that basically function as one extended curb cut from intersection to, to property boundary. And so, um, you know, as we're required, we're coming in with the sidewalk standard. We've asked that we allow one of those curb cuts uh, to remain to provide access to the front parking area um, while eliminating all other curb cuts on that street other than um, the curb cut to the rear parking area. Uh, the site plan that you have in your packet has been modified slightly um, through conversation and coordination with Metro Public Works. Uh, to comply with their requirements. It's shown as a two-way access on your site plan. Uh, we have worked with them uh, per their request to make that an entrance only off of Fatherland Street. Um, and then the rear lot is actually flipped directionally for traffic and angled stalls uh, such that you have continuous circulation through the property from Fatherland to the alley uh, through each parking lot back to Fatherland. Um, so I think that's really the only thing different than what you would, uh, than what you have in your packet. Um, and we, uh, per public works request, we, we signed it and striped it uh, in our most recent site plan uh, at their request for that to be an entrance only. I don't think I have anything else left to present. Um, Do you have any questions? So public works like, wanted you to make it a, a, a dead end drive aisle? They did not want us to make it a dead-end drive-out. They only want us to have a one-way directional traffic. A one-way, I got you. Yes. Okay. So it, it's still set up for 90-degree okay. uh, parking, um, but they, they just want it as an entrance only with the with an exit only to the alley. And so that's how we've currently set it up. Um, I think I also failed to mention that it's, it's pretty clear and obvious that, that we also are eliminating that pull-in street parking that's currently there uh, with the site plan. <laughs> what will the proposed use be in the building now? The proposed use, it's a mixed use of, there's a restaurant bar concept, there is a uh, wellness clinic concept, um, and there is a community center space that is going to be available. Um, so it's three uses. There may be a, a fourth <coughs> available use for a small pharmacy, um, but I don't know that they've finalized that quite yet. But the front portion is that restaurant bar concept with the patio, and then the rear space is for the uh, wellness clinic community uh, center space, and, uh, and I think potential for a pharmacy in there as well.
as well. Um, and I think the hardship is that if, um, if the variance request is not approved, they would need to tear down the existing building in order to get the um, curb cut um, within the required distance and zoning code. And um, that would be the hardship is, I guess, reversely, we want to try to keep the existing building in place. So I can make that motion to see if anyone has a can, can I just ask one huge favor, just, just for clarification purposes? I'm going to ask we reopen the public sure. hearing just for. Does anybody have a reopen? Uh, okay, we'll step back up. Absolutely. It's real simple. I just want you to testify that there is a hardship based upon what you had earlier or what Christina said just a second ago. Yes, that's that's correct. That's the hardship, yes, correct? Yes, there, there is Good. a hardship. So we have a hardship. And uh, there would also be a hardship in that it would be a, a, a one way. Um, entrance exit, and there would be no, no, no access to follow in from a front parking area. Okay. Yeah, I was just making sure that we sort of met the yeah. the bootstrap. Thank you. Yes, sorry. Never Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Never trust Ford that says I want to ask you one easy question. <laughs> <laughs> Especially for him. Oh, that come on. Wow. Ow. <laughs> yeah, you need to put a whole lot
So what happened in terms of your uh, operating uh, permit? Just kind of walk us through the high uh, uh, point. I, to be honest, it was all my fault completely. I uh, opened the, the renewal and placed it on my desk, and then it probably got shuffled to the bottom. Um, as soon as I realized the error of my ways, I sent it in with the check and all the paperwork that needed to be uh, submitted. Uh, I've been paying taxes the whole time, so and I had no complaints, so I was um, not entirely sure what made me forget it, but uh, I just want to accept full responsibility, and I'll just ask you all to um, have some mercy on me, please. So, did this, were you up here before on expiration? Is that what I'm reading from this package? That you, there was a, you received a cease and desist letter in 2018, and you filed an appeal with the BZA, and we uh, ruled that you were able to apply on May 15, 2018. Yes, sir. So, what happened the first time? Same thing. <coughs> no, the first time I, I was looking at the wrong. Uh, numbers on the website. I was looking at um, the, the business side, I believe, um, and it said there were no permits available, so I was waiting for them to become available. Um, and then after I spoke with my council person, uh, he, he recommended that I apply immediately, and I did. Okay. So, it looks like you got the Expiration was sent on August 27, 2020, and then you removed your advertisement on September 2nd. We've got some help here now. So. I would say a lot of help now. <laughs> <laughs> I do not plan to be up here again. I, um, 
I've already put the renewal, new renewal date in my calendar and set it on repeat. Uh, in my defense, um, I was furloughed a little bit during COVID and it just got shoveled to the bottom. Um, I, make, I can't make any other excuses on that, but like he said, as soon as I found out, I sent it in. Um, and as soon as I got on board, I canceled everything to make sure I wasn't in, um, had anybody else staying. I, I can only offer you my promise, and I, I hope that's enough. Okay, thank you. Uh, all the other board members may have questions. I do remember the previous time you've been here, but I, I'm. It's not like you don't understand the system, and so I'm having a difficult time. Third time's the charm. I mean that's what you're basically saying, and 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 I am having a little bit of a difficult time right. wanting to be lenient. I mean, if this was the first gut rodeo, I'd probably say, well, maybe. But yes, I understand. I'm, I like you said, as soon. I mean, I was. I think you said 17 days late, um, and as soon as I realized the error, I sent it in promptly. The full check. Um, I've been paying my taxes on time every month. Just well, I don't. I don't think you were 17 days late. The permit expired May 22nd. It's 47 days in fact. Yeah, the, you, you sent the permit renewal in on August 7th, 47 days after the 30-day grace period expired. So it was more than a few days. It was a lot of days, a lot more than that. <coughs> is that is that accurate? I I, I mean I, I the, the problem is I don't remember when I got it. But when I did, as soon as I found it, I sent it in immediately with okay. the full payment, all the notarized information. It was, I mean, it was an error, honestly. Um, but like I said, been paying full taxes, have had no complaints whatsoever. Um, okay, well, thank you. No further questions from the board. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chetty. You have a seat. We're going to discuss. Thank you. So thank you. We'll close the public hearing. And uh, when, would, when would he be eligible again? Is it full, it's a year from now. We typically track it from the year from the last number. But this is one in which we have the discretion to reduce the year, is that right? That's my understanding, yes. <laughs> so, I, mean, I, think I always, and this might be the last time we get to see him because it will be somebody else's problem <laughs> in next year. Sorry. Well, I mean, they know about it because we know about the first violation. So, yeah, I understand. I think that if it was, you know, the first time around, we basically, we let the applicant, you know, the hearing was on May 3rd, and we allowed him to apply on May 15th, which is, you know, pretty, what we pretty much do when it's a first time violation, and there's, um, you know, they haven't rented it uh, after the, they received notice, and, and he didn't do that this time. It looks like when he received notice, he did stop. He took it offline. But it is a second violation, so I'm not comfortable. I think that has to be taken into consideration, and I'm, uh, I don't. I don't think he deserves to have to wait a year. It's a. It's an oversight, but I'm not comfortable with it being what we normally do for you know first time. January second. That's, that's about what I was thinking a couple of months would be. Yeah. Yeah, so, all right, is that a motion? The motion that we, yes, uh, based on it, that we find that the uh, administrator correctly did, performed his duties and that the applicant, or, or the, uh, in this case, yeah, the appellant is permitted to reapply on January 2nd of 2021. Okay, and I will second that. Any further discussion? Only, um, only that January 2nd is a Saturday. So how about January 4th? January 4th is perfect. Thank you. January 4th is the motion. All in favor? Raise your hand. That motion passes. So Mr. Steady, you're eligible to apply January 4th, 2021. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
since the administrator also said that they will, they'll have the other board up and running next year. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this case in May of 2022. We heard about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can tell we've been here for a while. That's right. Today. It's a long one. It's a long one. Okay. The next case is case 2020-215, located at 178 Second Avenue North. Wait, wait, if you would mind, sir, you probably need oh. to come over here and Sorry, uh, for, for distancing purposes. 178 Second Avenue North, Unit 403. Um, no one's here in opposition to this case either. Um, Mr. McBroom is here to, on behalf of Coates to make the presentation, um, and then the applicant will be asked to speak. Um, it is an item A, P, P, item A appeal, challenging the zoning administrator's denial of a short-term rental permit. The appellant operated after the permit expired within the DTC district. On March 22nd of 2018, the short-term rental permit application was initiated. On April 11th, 2018, Type 3 non-owner occupied permit issued. April 17th of 2018, first online activity. And April 3rd, 2019, the permit was renewed. On April the 11th of 2020, the permit expired, and the July host list of unpermitted short-term rentals includes this address. On September the 2nd, I uh, sent a notice of violation uh, for advertising operator short-term rental with expired permit, and then they need and inform them uh, and, uh, excuse me, on September 14th, the ad remain posted. I called uh, Mr. Thompson left the message. They need to remove the ads before September 22nd. On September 15th, I was in call from Ms. Thompson and I explained that the ads need to be removed and future bookings need to be canceled and how to file an appeal. On September 16th, BC appeal was filed. On the 18th, the ads were removed, bringing the property into compliance. There were 11 documented states after the permit expired, none of which occurred after receiving the violation notice, and there were no documented complaints on the property. Thank you, Mr. Ingram. Uh, Mr. Thompson, are you okay? Yes, sir. You'll step up. Thank you. So what happened that you let it expire? Uh, we had the wrong address on file. Um, I'm not sure. If we made an error, we renewed, and we actually changed the address, but uh, previously we'd been receiving the uh, reminders to renew at our home address, and um, for whatever reason this year it went to the property address. Uh, we overlooked it, and um, we have a, another rental property, and I made the mistake of thinking that it was the other one that was up for renewal, and that one was hit by a tornado, and so we did not, we opted not to renew that one this year, um, and, but I had the date wrong. Okay. And then you, as soon as you received the notice, you did not run it after that. Uh, Correct, and we canceled the future bookings as well. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Thompson? Okay. Thank you. Yep, sorry to make you take your time on this. Appreciate it, though. Okay. We'll close the public hearing and discuss thoughts. Um, this doesn't seem that egregious. Um, so I think I'd be willing to. Allow, uh, make a motion to uh, allow him to file again um, next Sunday. Okay, do you know the date of that? Oh, okay. Uh, You've now become our calendar clerk. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like I'm still in January. It looks like the ninth, yes. Yeah. Uh, vote number the ninth. Okay, so there's a motion that I'll second that. that um, the applicant be on the and I'm assuming part of your motion is the administrator did not err. Yes. That he's yeah, well, allowed to reapply on Monday overnight. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Okay. We have four. <laughs> <laughs> it was almost three and a half. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. I'll take it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well. Thank you. Got to make sure you stay awake. <laughs> what would have happened if I had voted no? You would have died. It would have died if I had voted no. It would have come up next time. Watch watch the video of it. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. So we're glad you voted yes. I would have done yes. that <laughs> Wow. <laughs> had I thought about that. Mm. <laughs> okay, Mr. Brown, ready to go. Next case is 2020-1019. 
220-221, located in 1907 Cape Capers Avenue, Unit 13. Item A, appeal, challenging zoning administrator's denial of the short-term rental permit. The appellant operated after the permit expired in the RM40 district. Mr. Broom will explain the circumstances. June 14, 2019, permit application was filed. On June 21st, 2019, I paid a non-owner occupied permit was issued. On June 21st, 2020, the permit expired. September 10th, 2020, notice of violation was sent by Inspector John Phelps. September 18th, 2020, the advertisements were changed to a minimum stay of 35 nights, which takes from short-term to long-term rental. September 21st of 2020, BZA appeal was filed. One document stay after the permit expired. No document stays after the receipt of the notice of violation, and no document uh, complaints against this property. Okay, thank you, Mr. Burns. And then, Mr. Chairman, we had received letters from folks who come to speak on this case today. I had to leave several hours ago because it was several hours ago. Is this opposition or just it, it is opposition. So I'll just submit that in writing to the board and okay. the appellants as well, so they're all on the same sheet. How many letters are there? Just one. Just one. Just one. Okay. Okay. Okay, 
you really, you know, I'm just going to make one comment. And, and you, you really need to make some peace with Aaron and Joe Testo. Um, can't say that their complaints are unwarranted, though. I mean, I wouldn't want to go out, but that's your job, not mine. Okay. No, I don't have any questions. All right. Well, like I say, you know, those complaints don't have anything to do with the short term property. It was a long term. Yeah, property. but the dog going to the bathroom in their yard isn't exactly something that you, you know, you, you should have. You want to be a good neighbor. I understand. Yeah, you, yeah. I mean, you said you wanted to be a good neighbor. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm just saying. Yeah, we, were, we, we do plan to reach out to all the neighbors and get them, you know, uh, it, let us know if they have any complaints. Nobody complained to us. But, like I say, that complaint had nothing to do with it being a short term. We don't allow pets in our short term rates. But you do in the long term. In the longer term, we did. In COVID, trying to cover our expense. Yeah, well, I'll take it back. Hardly Grand, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. She, she, the tenant was not allowed to have a pet. Okay? If they had a pet in there, it was that they were a pet. And we, and we have cameras on site. We never saw pets going in that. And now, there's a 12 unit building right next to it that has tenants in it, and they do have pets. So I think if she saw the pets doing that, it came from the 12 unit building and didn't have anything to do with the college. Okay, thank you, sir. We appreciate it. All right, thank you. Uh, there is no opposition that that's what she said. Okay, all right. So we'll close the public hearing, discuss. But I, I, it, was, it, it was an oversight. Uh, it's clear to me that the permit expired. I think that, you know, obviously they should make an effort to try to, you know, make sure the neighbors are happy, but I, I don't know, you know, to determine whether we can get to renew. I, I look at whether it looks like it was intentional, that kind of stuff. I'm not convinced it was an oversight, so, uh, but thoughts, anybody else, or a motion, or? I'll, I'll make a motion that, they, that the zoning manager, administrator did not err in revoking their permit, but they could reapply uh, Monday, November 9th. All right. Is there a second on that motion? Second. All right. All in favor of that motion, say aye. Raise your hand. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you understand that you can reapply Monday, November 9th. Good yes. luck to you. Yeah, I have to raise and slot a part, got it.